The Committee on Homeland Security, Subcommittee on Border and Maritime Security will come to order. The subcommittee is meeting today to examine border security through the perspectives of our local law enforcement, Border Patrol agents, and residents. Before we proceed any further as the chair, uh, I need to make just a few um, important announcements. It takes a tremendous amount of work to put a hearing like this together. I appreciate the interest shown uh, by the number of people who are in attendance today. And I also would like to thank the town of Salarita uh, for letting us use this beautiful facility for our hearing. Um, I'm now going to recognize myself for an opening statement. Uh, a few weeks ago, I convened my first hearing as the chairwoman of Border and Maritime Security Subcommittee on the important topic of border security, effectiveness, and situational awareness. My subcommittee heard in Washington, D.C. from Border Patrol and CBP Air and Maritime leadership on the conditions along the border from their vantage point. The testimony given by these government officials established further there seems to be a deep disconnect between what some politicians and poli policymakers in Washington, D.C. say about our current situation to secure the border and what I hear on a daily basis back here at home. Uh, this is not surprising considering many policymakers in the nation's capital have never seen or experienced the situation along our border, although we have invited many of them to come visit and see it firsthand. Uh, but this is something Southern Arizona residents live with every single day. At my first hearing, Border Patrol officials stated they have the ability to interdict and apprehend more than 80% of the illegal traffic on the southwest border, which sounds like an improvement from the last time they measured operational control of the border in 2010, where it stood at 44%. But the Border Patrol numbers only take into account what they see and fail to include all activity, the denominator. So they just have the numerator of what they were able to interdict, not the denominator of everything that's out there. So it's really an incomplete, if not misleading, figure and doesn't give an accurate assessment of their current strategy's effectiveness. At the same hearing, after I pressed them, CBP admitted to having only roughly 50% situational aware awareness of the border and border activity. That means of the illicit activity coming across our nation's roughly 2,000-mile southwest border, CBP only knows what's happening Certain in, with certainty in about half of it. And that doesn't mean they can interdict what they see, it just means that's what they said they have situational awareness of. The truth is the border is not secure as it needs to be. We all know that here in this room and in this community. And the Department of Homeland Security for years has been trying to sell the American people a false narrative that the border is now more secure than ever. Local, local law enforcement, business and community leaders, ranchers and res residents, those that I represent, have met with me and spoken to me on countless occasions, and you all have a different perspective. You also have a better understanding of the very real border security challenges faced by fellow citizens because you live and work here and experience the ramifications of an unsecure border every day. Viewing the border through the eyes of local residents, like those before us today, arms policymakers with firsthand experiences on what is and isn't working in border security efforts. And at the end of the day, I want to get down to the business of finding thoughtful, common sense solutions to improve border security. We are fortunate to have the brave men and women of the Border Patrol do all they can with the tools that they are provided. However, they're often hampered by outdated flawed strategies or political leadership that doesn't have the resolve to let them do what agents do best, secure the border and protect our communities and the homeland. Rural border security is a challenging task. Agents do a difficult job, often alone in rugged terrain. They are subject to a rising number of assaults, which are not frequently prosecuted, and on a daily basis put their lives on the line to prevent cartels from trafficking drugs, money, people, and weapons through our communities. Local law enforcement officers are often willing and able border security partners, so we need to properly fund and equip them uh, through programs like Operation Stone Garden in order to assist federal government's, the federal government's efforts. Information sharing, joint operations, and collaboration should be the pillars of this approach and will help maximize the results for the whole community. And every day, our fellow citizens, including many in attendance here today, must endure the hassle of border security checkpoints and fear the consequence of illegal activity on their property or have their businesses harmed by a perception of the border that is not totally square with reality. Legislation I authored that recently passed in the House directs the Border Patrol to develop a new strategy that's based on a full assessment of the threats along our southern border including where we have vulnerabilities, the impact of terrain, where we have gaps in situational awareness and operational control, and where the drug cartels are beating us. Having a frank and honest discussion about what the witnesses see and experience on the border and their proposed solutions will help us ensure the nation's border security efforts protect the citizens who live and work on the border every day, as well as secure the nation. 
We have a very diverse group of witnesses today to provide important perspectives on the challenges, complexities, and solutions regarding border security. As the saying goes, where you stand depends upon where you sit. And I think in this case, it maybe is adapted to where you stand depends upon where you live and where you work. And that, I think, applies for our witnesses here today. From reading some of the written statements, or all the written statements, of course, we do have some different viewpoints that will be expressed today uh, from our witnesses and some disagreements on how to address these issues on a variety of different topics. I look forward to a fruitful, spirited, but respectful discussion and debate on this issue. And I would ask we'd all consider, I think we can learn something from each other and maybe find some common ground, since we all have, I think, the desire to keep our country and our community safe. So let's start with that main objective and then figure out how we can find common ground to address these important issues. I look forward to the testimony of our witnesses today, each of whom brings a unique and per important perspective. I want to especially thank uh, my colleague from New Mexico, Mr. Pierce, uh, a fellow Air Force combat pilot as well, by the way. Mr. Pierce re uh, represents the 2nd Congressional District of New Mexico, which borders Arizona's 2nd Congressional District to the east. It's also home to many miles of the southwest border. And I now want to recognize a gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Pierce, for any opening statement you may have. Thank you. I'll just be brief. Uh, thanks for not saying also that you flew in this millennium and I flew in the last millennium. So <laughs> I appreciate uh, leaving that part out. Uh, the when when you when you deal with the voters, which we have to do every two years, you start to understand that, that they don't really want to focus too much on the exact circumstances of, of bills and legislation. Instead, it's like the tide moving back and forth. And I will guarantee you that people in this country right now do not feel safe. And so Washington can say the border is secure all they want. And, and I appreciate reading your testimony, sir, that that uh, says that we got work to do and we need to be more transparent, more honest. Uh, I think that the beginning point is exactly what we're doing here, getting all the stakeholders together. Uh, Congresswoman McSally came in and immediately took a lead role in this. Her district and mine butt up against each other. I'm just across the, into New Mexico all the way to El Paso. And we see very strong similarities. Uh, and you just have the sense here that, that the closer you get to the border, the more that people just are very unsettled. And we as a nation need to be dealing with that unsettlement. Of course, the problem is that some people want to solve it one way and some another. And so the testimony that I've read today, and I really appreciate uh, the balance that you have in the panels, because that's one of the keys. Uh, you can't just approach it from one direction. So I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I will just tell you frankly that I think both parties have gamed this issue for, for years. And so the fact that it's here and we're dealing with it in the fashion that the anger has reached the level that it has uh, just tells us uh, it's time to get to work and do what we were sent there to do, make hard decisions about very difficult things in a pragmatic and sensible way. So I'm looking forward to uh, the discussion and uh, seeing what we come up with. Thanks again. Appreciate uh, the invitation Thanks. to be here. Okay, so we have two panels today. The first panel has three people on it, and the second panel has five people on it. We tried to group them, generally speaking. Uh, we've got elected officials, uh, we've got a, a, a ca our Cochise County Sheriff, uh, and, and Mr. Del Cueto is uh, representing the Border Patrol agents, so this is kind of the official perspective, if that makes sense, the public sector perspective. And then the second panel has a mix of individuals that are, are from the community and the private sector uh, providing different perspectives. So I just want to wanted to lay that groundwork and I do want to acknowledge we do have the Pima County Sheriff uh, Nanos here in the audience we appreciate you you coming uh, for, our, for our discussion here today uh, so first I'll give a couple of introductions and bios here Sher Sheriff Mark Daniels is the sheriff of Cochise County Arizona a position he's held since November 2012 Sheriff Daniels began his law enforcement career in 1984 after serving in the United States Army and progressed through the ranks within Cochise County Sheriff's Office after working numerous specialty assignments and leadership roles he is a member of numerous organizations, including the Fraternal Order of Police, the National Sheriff's Association, the Southwest Border Sheriff's Association, and the Arizona Homeland Security Regional Advisory Council. Mayor Danny Ortega is the mayor of Douglas, Arizona. Mayor Ortega was born and raised in Douglas and also serves as the vice president of his family-owned business that was first established in Douglas in 1923. He has been involved in many organizations in the Douglas community, including the Douglas Chamber of Commerce and the Douglas Noon Lions Club. Mr. Art Del Cueto is the president of the Border Patrol Union Local 2544. Mr. Del Cueto has been a Border Patrol agent since 2003. 
and began his career in Casa Grande, Arizona, where he helped in the effort to establish a new substation at Three Points, Arizona. Prior to working for the Border Patrol, Mr. Del Cueto worked um, in a maximum security state prison in Tucson. The witness's full written testimony will appear in the record. The chair now recognizes Sheriff Daniels for his verbal testimony. Good morning, everybody. Chairwoman McSally, Mr. Pierce, thank you for having us today, and thank you, both of you, for just your awareness and support in, in these issues. Um, with me today is also Pima County Sheriff Chris Daniels, who's sitting to my right, who's also your Pima County Sheriff here, um, who works closely with us on the Southwest Border Task Force. With 83 miles of our national border within its jurisdiction, Cochise County plays a significant role in combating drug and human trafficking organizations and the associated violent crime which adversely affects Arizona residents and other areas throughout the United States. With 6,219 square miles, Cochise County is the 38th largest landmass county in the United States. One of Mexico's largest and most notorious trafficking organization, drug cartels, the Sinaloa Cartel, has long employed the use of local Mexican uh, drug trafficking organization, DTOs, to carry out cartel drug distribution and transportation in and throughout the United States. The Mexican drug trafficking organizations operating in Cochise County are highly sophisticated and innovative in their transportation methods. Violence against innocent citizens, public officials, law enforcement, and rival drug human trafficking groups in Mexico continues to escalate. The adverse effects of drug and human trafficking organizations operating in Cochise County not only have significantly diminished the quality of life of county residents, but also placed unbearable financial strain upon the budgets and resources of private and governmental agencies in the county. Having the true life experience to live and work as a law enforcement officer, deputy, and now sheriff in Cochise County since 1984, it has been an educational lesson for me to reference border security and the evolution of uh, this border. I have witnessed the escalation of violence by these careless assailants on our citizens, raising the question, who actually controls our borders? Cochise County has become known as a gateway to illegal activity for those unlawfully entering into the United States. The history of the border, which I think is critical to where we're at today, in the early 1990s, the federal government came up with a plan to address the unsecure, unsafe border. I call it the plan of the peace, and that was to protect the populated areas. Yuma, El Paso, and San Diego were targeted cities, along with the port of entries. The other half of the plan, which is a disturbing part of the plan, was to reroute that illegal activity into the rural parts of the southwest border. Mr. Pierce, your area, as you know, in New Mexico is a highly trafficked area, just like Cochise County, Santa Cruz County, and other parts of the southwest border. Since that time, um, there's been many changes since the early 90s with this plan being in place. We have had some successes, and that's the reduction in those protected P areas. Um, unfortunately, we've had increased illegal activity in the outside protected areas, outside the ports and populated areas, to include Cochise County. We've had fear and frustration increased in rural Cochise County along the southwest border. Ranch and farmlands damaged due to increased illegal activity. Property damage, fencing, livestock, water lines, burglary, thefts in rural Cochise County are on the rise. Violent crimes include homicides, assaults, rapes, drug and human sm uh, smuggling, etc. Transnational cartels and smuggling organizations have actually controlled and set up smuggling routes throughout Cochise County, which is ongoing as we speak. Lack of redefinition to the plan of the 90s. There's been no redefinition to this plan for over 20 years. Economic decline. Cochise County is losing population at a, a staggering rate. Uh, we were number one population decrease several years ago. I believe we're gonna be number one in the country again for population decrease. Legacy ranchers, I think we've had a half a dozen to a dozen ranches sold in the last uh, few years. Lack of federally elected leaders to address insecure borders. Fears creating a lack of trust and anger by citizens in Cochise County and along the border. Questionable consequences by federal government by those committing border crimes. Undue pressure on local law enforcement sheriffs to address these issues, fear and consequences for committing border crimes. Lack of funding for local law enforcement, the criminal justice system, corrections, our jails, in order to address border crimes at the local level due to the federal government's lack of intervention. Local solutions and programs are no longer a thought but a mandate. Many sheriffs on the southwest border to include Cochise County have took our stationary, a stationary excuse me, and elected oath seriously and the fact that to protect their freedoms and liberties. We have enacted many programs um, 
balance community policing through education, prevention, enforcement, transparency, plus time with built community trust, collaborated efforts coming from the local side with all three levels of government. Installation of new radio towers, radios, uh, working with our schools, working with our rural, we have 21 rural schools where they're all getting radios here in the next few months. Ranchers and citizens that live in the vulnerable areas, we're gonna be issuing them radios. Um, a regional application for law enforcement we're sharing together. We have a financial interdiction unit working on financial crimes along with a regional border team supported by the Border Patrol. <coughs> ranch advisory team where two deputies are taken off patrol to work just with the ranchers so they have an ear and a voice on that. A ranch advisory team made up of ranchers throughout Cochise County to help us to enhance communication. And consequence driven prosecution. And, and I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about that. Federal government has an issue um, prosecuting juveniles based on their mm -hmm. laws. We started this several months ago where we have an average of 26 juveniles from ages 14 to 17 in my jail that are now being prosecuted as adults uh, and sent to prison for a year and a half. And these are ones when Border Patrol picks up a, a backpacker, they turn them over to the Sheriff's Department or a local agency who makes the arrest, then we prosecute them through our local county attorney. It's a partnership, where it's called a righteous partnership. Before this was going on, these vulnerable youth, both on our local side from our local high schools and across the line, were being recruited by the cartels to smuggle drugs into our United States. We took a um, prevention enforcement approach toward that. The federal government and elected policymakers have been slow to react to the voices and concerns of those living on the southwest border. The following conference and recommendations are directly linked to our federal leaders and given to you based on what we see. Redefine the plan of the 90s and build upon the successes. There needs to be a political will to make border security a mandated program and not a discretionary one. Border security first, immigration reform second. Secondary checkpoints only after primary border interdiction is satisfied by the stakeholders. Quality in life, citizens living on the border supported by sheriffs and state governor folks regarded improved security safety. Funding supplement for local law enforcement, prosecution, detention, criminal justice in support of border crimes. SCAP uh, needs to be enhanced. Right now it's at 4.8 cents on the dollar for reimbursing sheriffs to uh, hold illegals. County funding and support for Stone Guard program has been a success. Please don't <laughs> remove that. To include the ERE's, the employees related expenses that go with that. That's very important to rural counties. Enhanced funding for regional communication and interoperability with local law enforcement. There was a staggering number, the article came out here, in, uh, where in 2015, 19,000 criminal aliens were released back into communities in the United States. That's a lose-lose for every sheriff and police chief in this country and for the morale of our uh, Border Patrol, the men and women that serve in our Border Patrol, which we have a great relationship in our county. The recipe of success for this problem starts at the local level first. Our local efforts have proven to be beneficial in bringing overdue solutions to an unsecured board that has become a discretionary program by those federally elected leaders and policymakers that have, have been entrusted by, to protect our freedoms and liberties. As a sheriff elected by the good people of my county, my biggest fear is another loss of life to one of my citizens and or law enforcement officers, agents contributed contribute to a border that is not secure. One would hope the priority of securing our border doesn't become just another price tag and or political posturing, but rather legal and moral requirement of, to safeguard all of America, which so many heroic Americans have already paid the ultimate price for. Today's opportunity to address this group instills fresh hope that our voice does matter, and on behalf of the citizens of Cochise County, the Southwest Border Sheriffs, Arizona Sheriffs, and beyond, we hope you won't forget us and will do your constitutional mandate to bring positive change to an overdue, vulnerable situation. With that, I leave you an open invitation, Mr. Pierce. I know Ms. Sally's been down there numerous times. Her and I have spoken, driven around, and she's actually not seen a show-and-tell border, but a real border. Thank you. Thanks, Sheriff Daniels. The chair now recognizes Mayor Ortega to testify. Thank you, Chairwoman McSally. Representative Pierce, thanks for joining us here today. I'm Mayor of Douglas, Arizona, and also a businessman. Uh, my family came to Douglas in the early 1920s and established a shoe business there, and we've been running it ever since. We've been very active in our community as a family and myself personally as well. When you come to our town, I hope you see security through our eyes. I think the residents of our community feel very safe in Douglas, and we have many binational events with the sister city of Agua Prieta. We recently had a binational concert that drew hundreds of people. 
where a, a band played on the Mexican side and then followed by a band on the American side. I understand the need for more security away from the ports of entry, but we cannot let that get in the way of the legal crossing of goods and people. As I have often heard, we need high fences and wider gates. We also need to talk about making it more efficient and easier to trade goods and services with Mexico. Total U.S. goods to trade with Mexico in 2013 equaled $506.6 billion and growing at close to 5%. Mexico is the third ranked commercial trading partner with the United States and the second largest market for U.S. exports. Trade with Mexico sustains 6 million jobs in the United States. Sal sales to Mexico are larger than all U.S. exports to Mexico, I mean, excuse me, to Brazil, Russia, India, and China combined. 22 U.S. states count Mexico as their number one or two trading partner in exports, a top five market to 14 other states as well. For every dollar Mexico makes from exporting to the United States, it will in turn turn 50 cents in on U.S. products or services, which helps our struggling economy. In May of 2010, the U.S. and Mexico signed the 21st Century Border Management Joint Declaration, recognizing the importance of developing a modern and secure border infrastructure to make us both more competitive in the global market. Our ports are antiquated and we do not have the staffing to support the growing trade and border crosses at our southern ports of entry. We have struggled and are making do with what limited resources we have, yet are unable to handle the projected growth without more border, with more, uh, more bodies and money at our ports. Border towns have been ignored for many years, even though we provide access to one of the fastest growing economies in the world. China is starting to have better relations with Mexico and is one of our biggest competitors for the burgeoning economy. We need to view the southern border as an asset and not a liability. Locally in Douglas, our current port was built in 1936 with minor upgrades done in 1993. We have outgrown the facility and put the officers and people crossing at risk. If there is ever a chemical spill at our current port, we do not have a hazmat facility that could control such a spill. We, can, we ship many chemicals to the mines in uh, Cananea, Mexico and Nacuazari. We have trucks waiting for extended periods of time, polluting the air with exhaust. We do not have the modern equipment to inspect trucks or cars because of the lack of funding and space. Douglas is considered a small port, yet over one and a half billion dollars worth of merchandise crosses our port on a yearly basis, and that number is growing at about 5% over the last five years. We have seen growth in the maquilador industry of about 40% in the past uh, five years, and that, that growth is starting to show on the American side. We currently applied for a new port of entry. We think we need to take the commercial port out of our local uh, footprint. Uh, Congressman McSally has been very supportive of that effort and we thank you for that. The cattle industry is also very large in our area. We currently cross about 1,500 head of cattle a day in the peak season of November to May. That's over $2 million a day in cattle crossing to help support the American appetite for beef. We need some in investment in our ports of entry. Roads, the road to the cattle pen is currently a dirt road that is not maintained. Uh, we're looking to work with some of our local uh, investors to see how we can improve that port. We also need to streamline the process in which Mexican citizens have the ability to obtain a B1 or B2 border, cro border crossing card to come to the United States shop and visit our communities on a legal basis. As our general funds from the sales tax excuse me, 65% of our revenue for the city of Douglas comes from sales tax, and 80% of that money comes from the Mexican consumer. We need help in just getting people across the border, back and forth. I've spoken to many friends on the Mexican side. Many are proud to be Mexicans. They do not want to come and live here. Some say they just want to come here and shop, visit our country, and then go back home. There's a net loss in migration currently, according to the Pew Institute. More people are actually, Mexicans are leaving our country versus coming into our country. And we hope we can just get, leave this, meeting today with the thought of we need easier access for people and goods and services to come across. We really need investment in the infrastructure, our ports of entry, and our roads. Uh, thank you for listening to me today, and I'll entertain any questions later. Thank you. Thanks, thank Mayor Ortega. And uh, for the record, Chair, I just want to make a comment that we our second hearing we had in Washington, D.C. last month was really focusing on the infrastructure and the staffing mm -hmm. at our ports of entry, which is uh, has been a critical issue for us in our community, really across the country, and uh, identifying what we can do to speed up the hiring of the uh, CBP officers 
as well as uh, upgrading the infrastructure project. We've very much have been working closely on that and are dialing on that. You know, today we're trying to focus on the in between the ports and the security issues there, but it's important to have the full picture, uh, you know, of our witnesses as we're sort of framing the discussion. So I just want to highlight we're not ignoring that issue in this particular hearing, but I just wanted to frame that, especially for our, our audience. Thank uh, you. The chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Del Cueto for to testify. Chairwoman McSally, Congressman Pierce. Thank you for providing me the opportunity to testify on behalf of the National Border Patrol Council and on behalf of the local 2544, the union here in Tucson, Arizona. The National Border Patrol Council represents the interest of 16,500 line agents at the Border Patrol. My name is Art Del Cueto. I am a native of Douglas, Arizona, and I have been with the Border Patrol since 2003. One of the many areas in which the Border Patrol excels in keeping statistics is the Border Patrol can tell you in detail how many agents we have they can tell you the number of overtime hours that are worked, the number of apprehensions, or the hours of air support delivered by CBP Air and Marine Operations. It's really quite impressive. If I was a member of Congress from a non-border state and I sat through a CBP briefing about how the border was secure, I would be inclined to believe them. The primary statistic that Commissioner Kurlikowski talks about today in support of his belief that the border is secure is the number of apprehensions which is down. At the height of illegal immigration in 2000, Border Patrol apprehended 1.6 million people. In the Tucson sector alone that year, we arrested 616,000 illegal immigrants. To put this in perspective, the entire population of Tucson in 2000 was 486,000. That was how massive this influx was. Back in 2000, we were facing a wave of Mexican economic migrants in search of employment. There was little organization and most illegal immigrants simply loaded up a backpack of supplies, jumped the border and headed north. This lack of organization frankly made them relatively easy to catch if you could deploy border patrol manpower. Fast forward to 2016. The entire border is controlled by the Mexican drug cartels. The drug cartels control the border in the same way that most prisons are controlled by the inmates. Nothing moves along this border without their permission and illegal aliens and narcotics are simply two lines of business within that same organization. Here in Arizona, we have the Sinaloa cartel. The 63,000 individuals that we arrested last year in this sector paid the cartel a considerable amount of money just to cross in our area. Only based on the individuals we arrested in this sector, the Sinaloa cartel made millions from illegal alien smuggling. If there is one point that I want to make in this entire testimony, it is that the money that the cartels earn from illegal smuggling underwrites that exact same organizations that are flooding our streets with narcotics. Money is flowing back to the same organizations that are responsible for the violence in Mexico, which has murdered over 150,000 people. It is going back to the same organization that, threaten, that threatens the very viability of Mexico as a sovereign democracy. This is the nature of the threat that we are facing. The last time we had comprehensive immigration reform in this country was in 1986 with the passage of the Immigration Reform and Control Act. This legislation gave amnesty to any illegal immigrants who had arrived before 1982 and it is responsible for the tidal wave of illegal immigrants that we saw in the 90s. When the Senate was considering immigration reform three years ago, many warned about what, would happen, what had happened after 1986. The administration, in particular, former Arizona Governor Janet Napolitano, who was then Secretary of Homeland Security, promised the American people that it would be different this time because the border was secure. If a wave of illegal immigrants came, Border Patrol would handle it. It was a terrific talking point. Too bad it was completely untrue and ignored the emergence of the Mexican drug cartels. Although immigration reform is a distant memory, the administration is painted into a corner now. If the border is secure, how do you ask Congress for more manpower? If the border is secure, how do you ask for money for additional air support, for technology, and for more fencing? For the administration, the answer is real simple. You don't. You don't talk about the Mexican drug cartels. You talk about how apprehensions are down and how well things are going. If we were to going to get serious and solve the problem, we first have to be honest and admit that the problem, problem does exist. 
If you are serious about confronting the, the drug cartels, there are some concrete steps that need to be taken. First, manpower. The National Border Patrol Council believes that the Border Patrol is at least 5,000 agents before below where we need to be to be effectively controlling the border. More agents in the field. The Border Patrol is an extremely top-heavy organization with multiple layers of management that are completely removed from the field. If the Border Patrol has the same supervisory and staffing ratio that Sheriff Daniel's department has, we could return close to 2,000 agents back to the field. More effective deployment. Currently, almost all our resources are clustered too close to the border. We are effectively playing goal line defense every single day. If an illegal immigrant or a drug smuggler gets more than 10 miles north of the border, they might likely not get caught. We need to have a defense in depth with multiple layers in order to be effective. We also need to make rational decisions to the use of forward operating bases. Forward operating bases had a time and place years ago but are an incredibly inefficient use of resources today. End our catch and release program. One of the main drivers of illegal immigration in our own is our own immigration policies. For example, under the current policy, if a border patrol agent does not physically see an illegal immigrant cross the border and the illegal immigrant claims that they have been here since 2014, we have been ordered to process them and let them go. In many instances, we will be letting them go without even issuing a notice to appear. This is a policy that is senseless. It is literally driving illegal immigration to our front door. I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify, and I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Cueto. Uh, I now recognize, recognize myself for some opening questions, and then I'll, I'll uh, provide opportunities for Mr. Pierce, and then we'll probably have a couple rounds here. So. Uh, first, I want to ask really the whole panel. It's a two-part question. Uh, the first one is, what do you think is the biggest misperception in Washington, D.C. on what's really going on in the border? And the second part of that is, in a little over eight months, we're going to have a new commander-in-chief. We're going to have a new secretary of Homeland Security. Um, if you were asked, or you were, you know, you're the new secretary, or you were asked by the new secretary, what is it that we need to do in order to secure the border you, you had, you were resource unconstrained. What would your answer be to that question? I'll start with Sheriff Daniel. Thank you. The, the first thing is that take off the myth and, and uh, Mr. Del Cueto. Cueto, if I can say that right, uh, states it clearly is you got to identify there's a problem. And that has been a myth through media, through different change, different avenues. But the bottom line is they need to identify there's a problem so you can fix the problem and that the border is not secure. This plan needs redefinition, like I said in my brief, and said in my verbal um, um, statement today, we have to identify that. Number two is, is you have all layers of government working together, starting at the local. Community problems have been addressed for years and years and been successfully addressed in communities first, not in Washington, D.C. You have to start with your local law enforcement, your citizens that live it and breathe it, along with our state state partners and then our federal partners. And get, that's when we take these oath of office. That's why we're leaders, to work together in partnership. Thanks, Sheriff Daniel. Mayor Ortega? Um, I guess maybe in a little different perspective. I think our border communities are very safe uh, on both sides of the border. My sister said about Prieta and Douglas are very safe communities. And there's a lot of trade that goes back and forth between our communities. I unfortunately disagree with Mr. Del Cueto, I think, in talking to some of the outlying areas, they want more agents closer to the border to try and stop the, the people f illegally coming across, which well, primarily drugs at this time. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as our community goes, there's our community is safe, but I think the outlying areas are not, and I think they would like to see more agents closer to the border. I wish there were some incentives to have the border patrolmen actually live within our communities. It, it seems as though we don't have agents living in our communities getting to know who we are as a community, who the good people and who the bad people are. I think that would ease a lot of the relations between the border patrolmen and the communities that they serve. Okay, thanks, Mayor Ortega. Mr. Del Cueto? I would outline what I've uh, stated previous. The border is not secure. Um, there's many communities within Mexico where the uh, drug cartels and the people that work for these cartels run rampant. Just in the sister city of Douglas, uh, I, I think, I believe a year ago, 
Um, they had declared some kind of law where they had to close down the streets at 10 p.m. because people were getting randomly murdered. Um, I think they need to pay attention to the boots on the ground uh, and get away from this dog and pony show that D.C. brings down here to the borders and explains that everything's nice and happy. It's not. It, it is a war zone out there. Uh, in Tucson sector alone, I believe within this last two weeks, we've had three shootings already. Um, it is not secure. There are individuals that once they get past uh, the agents that are near the border, they pretty much are home free, and it's harder for us to find them and detect them. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so I, I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth, but I c can we, c does the first panel, do all of you agree that, um, and again, this is the, I think the second order consequences of the strategy over the years, right, has been populated areas first, right? Let's address, uh, again, we saw addressing even California, pushing then the activity into Arizona, and then within Arizona, uh, addressing trying to uh, deal with the urban areas first, pushing the illegal activity into the rural areas. And so the consequence of that is the rural areas are where the high propensity of this, especially cartel activity, is happening, uh, which is increasing uh, danger and security for those that are living out in the rural areas. Is that is that a fair statement to make that the whole panel agrees upon? I would agree. And if I could say so, Mayor Ortega, when he speaks about the security of the city, He's a direct product of that plan from the 90s, and he's exactly right. Douglas is safer than it ever has been, but that illegal activity, uh, as you're describing, is in Cochise County and the rural parts, and those folks who live out there don't deserve that. Are you agreed? Yes. Agree. Yes, I agree. Okay, thank you. Um, and and so g given that now we're dealing with, the, okay, this is a public safety issue uh, to these rural communities uh, that are often – Miles and miles, we heard from our second panel, you know, sometimes away from another individual out there kind of on their own dealing, dealing with this cartel activity. So uh, what do we do to change that? I mean, we've here, we have differences of opinions on at the border, away from the border. We can continue to talk about that. I think, you know, Mr. Pierce may we talk a little bit about that. Uh, but what about the combination of um, barriers, uh, technology, air assets, manpower. I just, does anybody have a comment on uh, the strategy as it relates to the mix of these, uh, uh, you know, these types of tools and whether there needs to be a change, new strategy, more resources related to the types of tools that are not just the number of agents and where the agents are, but, you know, the, the larger strategy. I just want to hear from everybody on that. I, I can start with that. You know, the, uh, the bill that was tr attempted to be passed several years ago, the Gang of Eight, you know, wanted to add 20,000 more agents. And I know the Southwest Border Sheriff's Arizona Sheriff Association, we took a large stance on that because there was no strategic plan to place those 20,000 agents. And show me a business that can hire 20,000 more employees and not have a plan. I, I think we need to take the excesses of the current plan, put that forward, as you said, 5,000 more agents, whatever the number is, but strategically know what you're going to do with those agents and bring that plan back to the border where we know the problem is beginning, not downtown Phoenix, but at the border, mm -hmm. and then take it backwards from there. The other thing is, and I think it's uh, something that needs to be said, is what does get through that border is not just Cochise County's problem. It's America's problem. The heroin that's coming through, as we know, I testified on that before, the methamphetamine, the marijuana that goes in the, uh, these communities throughout the United States is an epidemic. There, there's a cultural mindset that needs educated, that needs prevention on, and the fact that if we don't change our social ways, our cultural ways, because the United States folks here have a healthy appetite for those drugs. If we didn't have that appetite, we wouldn't have the, the demand, and they wouldn't be able to ship it across. So I need to take, we need to take a real hard look at that and take a comprehensive look at how we're doing business and, and listen to the lying agents. They know. I, I, I teach at one of the universities. I hear in my classes the frustration that they see it, they live it, they breathe it too. They have to have a voice at this table besides somebody um, that doesn't work the border is disconnected. There has to have that voice there. And then you got the economic side, like the mayor is addressing today. I, I used to take a oath for public safety. No offense, not for economics. <laughs> and so I, I do. That's my oath of office is to protect my citizens as he's looking for legal trade, legal immigration. I have no issue with it. It's the legal aspect I, I am I'm after. Thanks, Sheriff. Sure. Mayor Ortega? I also think we need some investment in not only the infrastructure for our ports, but the technology within our ports. As, as you've seen, <coughs> our areas are very rugged. It'd be hard to get a vehicle in there, even with roads. Mm -hmm. I've heard from some other ranchers that when you build a road, you build roads also for illegal drug traffic to come across. So I think we need to be careful with that one. But there's technology out there, whether it's drones or that type of equipment, to survey the outlying areas. 
but also the increased technology at our ports of entry. I think we're going to start seeing more drug trade crossing through our ports uh, unless we uh, invest in some infrastructure to check not only the trucks and the but the passenger vehicles as well. Okay, thanks. One of the big things they need to focus on is these policies. They need to change and start enforcing some of these policies that we have on the book. Um, currently, like other people have, have noted, the illegal immigrants that enter in Arizona, the numbers have gone down. But like I stated earlier, those numbers have gone down because the drug cartels are the ones that are running everything on the south side. Tucson sector currently still sits well over 50% at all the drug seizures that are uh, seized in the entire country. That is an outstanding number. We need to take care of that. Uh, what I mean by some of these policies is, uh, first of all, you know the catch and release program that's been so much talked about. But there's another issue. Uh, there is no disincentive for Central Americans currently to enter the United States. Currently, we can have a group of uh, a family, and I'm going to give you an example. You can have a family of uh, people from Central America that come. They turn themselves in, which is what's happening in Texas. The numbers in Texas are going up because they're turning themselves in. We're not catching these individuals. So you have these Central Americans that are turning themselves in. They come to, to the Border Patrol. We take them into our facilities. We do the proper checks to see if they have any prior uh, criminal history within the United States. But we're not aware of any history that they might have in Central America. So what happens with these individuals is they're turned over to ICE. ICE then releases them into our communities. They're going throughout the entire part of the, all different parts of the United States. Um, they tell them that they have to come back and report to an immigration office. These people are never reporting back to the immigration office. So what we've done with these policies is we facilitated an open door for these Central Americans that we have no idea what crimes they've committed in their, in their country. We have no idea if they can be rapists, murderers, ax murderers. We just don't know who these people are. And we have facili facilitated a way for them to remain in this country. They have ties with who knows who back in Central America. That's where we need to start. These policies that are on the books that are being pushed, they need to stop. We don't know how many people they've released. I think that's a number that should be asked of ICE. We don't know how many of these Central Americans with uh, cr possible criminal backgrounds in their own country that we have no idea where they're at. Okay, thanks. Um, back to those that are trying to evade, the cartels that are bringing drugs across the border. Uh, just, I want to hear your comments on, do we need additional barriers, additional technology, air assets? You, you've mentioned the agents, but what else do you think would address those that are trying to evade you? You, you hear so much talk publicly about this wall, and some people say the wall works, some people say the wall doesn't work. Well, it's not just the wall that we need. Obviously, a wall is a huge deterrent. We would, uh, we would see how it was back in the, in the mid-'90s in, in Douglas area alone, where it was easier to cross the border because uh, there was less of a wall there, less of a barrier. The barrier works. We need, obviously, more agents on the ground. We need agents to be able to move back and forth, not just stay on the border and, and on the line itself. We do need more technology. Um, we need more vehicles. The vehicles, you know, they get treated really rough at times, but it's because that's just the nature of the job. Uh, we definitely need more vehicles. There's, there's just a lot of uh, different things that we would need, vehicles, uh, night vision goggles, mm -hmm. sensors. It's, it's, it's a mass amount that we need out there. Okay, great, thank you. Mr. Pierce? Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate all of your testimony. Um, Mr. Del Cueto, I really appreciate the straightforwardness. That's something that I think we in Washington hunger for, but when you talk to those people up the chains of command, frankly, it gets muddled and outright untruths are told. So having you sit here and tell the, the truth that you see from the ground level is extremely valuable. Now I'm gonna come back with some hardball questions in a minute for you, but they're not directed at you. It's the decisions made somewhere above you, and, and frankly, I can't get them to answer, so I'm gonna come back. But don't, don't take them personally, because I really yeah. do appreciate uh, th that you're saying things that, that we all believe, that the cartels own the border. I mean, that's very powerful for someone inside an agency to say that, the agency that's in charge with it. Mr. Ortega, I want to do a little housekeeping on you. You were saying uh, that, that uh, you would disagree with the other two, that the border is secure and that you feel safe. Now, when the, uh, when the sheriff says, well, the, the city is safe, but, uh, but it's not in the rural areas, you're shaking your head. 
can I, and the head shakes don't show up on the transcript, frankly. And so in Washington, they're only going to, uh, they're <laughs> going to quote you. Nah, this mayor says it's okay. So could you confirm just verbally that, that you would agree that the rural areas um, are, are struggling for feeling safe uh, while your area feels okay? Is, is yes, sir, that's okay, correct. Okay, all right, so yes, we got you on the right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because it is, I mean, people, people will take your one sentence and that'll be the only thing they would extract out of this mm -hmm. entire hearing. So yes, I, I again, appreciate the recognition. Yes. Now, uh, Mr. Del Cueto, you say that you would use 5,000 more people. I was there. And keep in mind that, that we had to fight, fight the Bush administration equally as hard as this one. It is not a Republican-Democrat issue. It is Washington saying everything's okay and we're going to do it this way. And the people out in the field, we're going to say they're lying or cheating or stealing or something. We're just going to. So I watched as we put 10,000 more agents. We doubled the, the patrol from 10-something, 12, up to about 23. And yet the, the general consensus of people who live in the New Mexico side of, of the border said it didn't change things a bit. Tell me how 5,000 people would solve that or why that 10,000 didn't, if you can. And again, I know this should be coming from way high up, but they just refused to answer the question, frankly, in the hearings up there. So it's a two-part question. I'll first start with uh, the, the mass amounts of hiring that we did and uh, with the extra 10,000 that you mentioned. A lot of these issues is the Border Patrol grew but other agencies didn't grow. So what happened many times is these, these same agents that we hired within the patrol were farmed out to other agencies. There were agencies farmed out to prosecutions within the, uh, the states. There was also agents that were farmed out to the ports of entries. Some of our canines were sent to the ports of entries. So a lot of the agents that did, the new agents that came in were farmed out to other uh, okay. agencies. And at the same time, they developed other programs so I believe that's where the top heaviness comes in. They put too many agents in other programs that aren't really uh, line agents. Um, so when we ask for these additional 5,000 agents, that's why it's, it's a mixture of the policies and the internal uh, business within the Border Patrol where they need to know how to deploy these agents and uh, do away with some of these programs and maybe some of these top heavy agen uh, agency programs that we do have. Okay. Now, from your testimony, uh, and you don't have to answer the next question, and feel free to just say, hey, I'm not touching it. Uh, but uh, from your testimony, it seems that you were critical of the amnesty program back under Reagan because we did not do anything to secure the border. And so my question is, do you think that amnesty, and, and keep in mind, Washington, from our side of the table, only talks big issues. They don't ever get down and really discuss what we're discussing here today. So amnesty versus not amnesty, is amnesty uh, productive or is it simply an encouragement to other people that uh, if I get there illegally, they'll fix it? And you don't have to answer if you don't want to. To, your, to, to, to help you out, you did tell me I didn't have to answer it, but unfortunately I'm gonna go ahead and answer it. Okay. Um, nice. <laughs> it does not help. Yeah. Uh, I lived in, in, in Douglas, like I said before, and I saw uh, many people that would cross into uh, Douglas that never lived here, that never worked here, and they would, play, they would pay different uh, business owners, uh, not just in, in Douglas, I would say, but business owners within the United States so they can uh, get paperwork stating that they had been here, and then those individuals, uh, a lot of them uh, were able to obtain amnesty. And uh, the individuals, some of the individuals that were actually here and uh, fit in the mold for the amnesty program never did because they couldn't give the $5,000 to the whoever employed them at that point to give them documentation. So in your estimation is the great resource, uh, the use to the great resource for the cartels came from drug smuggling. Now then it sounds like human smuggling probably eclipses that and drug smuggling is the secondary revenue producer. What is your opinion of that? Well, I think it's both. Um, like I said, we through intel that we acquire, you know, we catch different individuals in these areas, and they've uh, that's where we've uh, the border patrol has received information, and we know that a lot of these individuals uh, they run the, the the drug smuggling and the people smuggling. So yeah, the drugs are the ones that are making most of the money. Yeah. The next question is not intended to be tricky. I'm going to come over to you, Sheriff, uh, but it's intended to instead, I think, reflect the culture that ties the hands of our Border Patrol agents. I'm, I have sat out there on the border in the night. I think that our agents could and would do the deal, but I think people above them give them policies, but like catch and release policies. 
So, again, these are not very easy questions. You can dodge it if you want to. <laughs> I don't. But uh, so I read somewhere that that approximately 1,300 Border Patrol agents in Cochise County, more or less. That's correct. That's correct. We have 1,300 Border Patrol agents. Uh, well, I didn't get to my question yet. Oh. <laughs> you, you were going to take the easy road. I'm not going to let you <laughs> do that. Excuse me. The, um, if you had 1,300 people under your command, could you secure the border in Cochise County? Yes. All right. The, so just to, to repeat what we did, because uh, you're getting counsel there. And <laughs> it's good. <laughs> it's trying to protect us all. The, uh, I probably need counsel at this stage myself. <laughs> but the, what I ask is if he could secure the border with 1,300 people, and he says yes. Now, I tend to agree that if, uh, and it's not your people, again, it's the process and it's the system. If you had your 1,300 people and we turned you loose and said secure the border, I think you could. I don't know that the process, I don't know that the system is ever going to let you do it. And so many times I say the only solution is to take the resources and let them work for local elected law officials. Right now, local citizens have no recourse at all. They get frustrated, they get angry, they speak to people like us, they, they get us stirred up, we come out and we make y'all angry. And, and it's because nobody is accountable. And I, I sincerely believe, because again, I've been on the border with the agents out there with their boots on the ground, and I know the heart they have to do and they talk the same way that you talk here today. And so the great appreciation and great love I have for, for those agents is dispelled because the system is plain keeping it from working. And so always I just say that if a local sheriff had the responsibility and he had your resources, he could do it. And if he didn't, they could unelect him. But right now the system cannot respond. And so somewhere we have to, a solution has to reach, reach that, uh, that level. A couple more questions on process, and <laughs> I still quit. The, the, uh, so I've heard, I don't know if it's just scuttlebutt or whatever, that if people are headed south, if the fr footprints are headed south with somebody that's created a crime, that they just don't pursue them because they're headed south and they're probably going to get there before we get them. That's something we hear a lot in New Mexico. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not. Maybe it's just those guys that were in El Paso, you know. No, I, 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 I can't testify to that one. I can tell you that here, I, I myself, I work the field, and I have followed footprints uh, all the way to south. Okay. Um, some of the issues that we have is there, we don't know how many are in that footprint. Yeah. So what you do is you chase a group, whether it be headed north or be headed south, and um, they, these individuals walk in a line. So if you can count um, five footprints, you would say five to ten people. Um, I remember... Uh, chasing a group where um, I counted 15 footprints and I, I called back and I said we have 20 plus we continued chasing this group and when we finally apprehended it it was a group of 60 people so when you're saying 20 plus um, 60 that that's a big difference between 20 plus most people think 20 plus and it's 23 24 people uh, in this instance it was 60 individuals um, and and that's a huge deal um, to touch back on uh, having more agents, and uh, uh, Mr. Dano said that he can control it with 1,300 agents. A lot of the thing is some of these agents are put in VCO positions, so they need to take care of the vehicles. A lot of these agents are put in processing. They need to process. We have uh, different agents that are detailed to different positions. Um, in the, I, I will state down in Cochise County, there's uh, agents that uh, before we used to work uh, different areas of the border. I understand the ranchers' concerns. I understand that there's uh, the ranchers that need more agents in their area. So what that has caused, it has caused a lot of the agents to uh, not work certain areas, and you have some agents bunched up near the ranchers. So now what has happened is you've left other areas more porous. Um, it was just recently in the news in Cochise County alone, two vehicles came through. Um, we never apprehended those vehicles. We don't know what was in those vehicles. We don't know where those vehicles are. And uh, at that point, it was limited resources that were available in that area. The majority of these agents were stationed over near the ranchers. Okay. I've just got one follow-up to that, and I'll pitch it back to you. But if you go to a second round, I obviously we have a couple <coughs> more questions here. But um, So the idea 
has also been pitched out in, in New Mexico and, and local sheriffs have said it's true. I don't know that it's true, but uh, the idea that you, the Border Patrol just doesn't seek out or prosecute or hold people with less than a certain amount of drugs, and that, that number usually varies somewhere between 120, 150 pounds, maybe more. Is that a, a thing that you find in y'all's directives, or is that something you don't want to comment on? And again, feel free not to comment. I'm not trying to do anything to your career. <laughs> Well, I've been doing this for quite some time, so okay. I think my career in moving up in the Border <laughs> Patrol is pretty much shot <laughs> I already. Both I appreciate the same it, Congressman. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate you putting the nail in the coffin on this one. <laughs> um, no sweat. Uh, we've got uh, really good positions there in Washington. There's, there is many times that we do arrest individuals, and we do call the prosecutor, and the prosecutor says it fails to meet prosecution guidelines. Oh, okay. I will say that. All right. Uh, Madam Chairman, thank you very much. I appreciate this. Very good, very good information. I yield back. Great, thanks. Okay, we're going to do a, another round here. Uh, Sheriff Daniels, I, I wanted to, uh, it was in your written testimony, I want to uh, allow you an opportunity to elaborate on the use of spotters, and actually Mr. Del Cuarto as well. This is something we've heard from the community, from you know multiple law enforcement agencies, uh, that the cartels are using spotters on hilltops uh, with often better communications than our guys have, uh, you know, encrypted uh, solar panels, and uh, sometimes they're up there 30 days at a time, and if we can uh, get them, it's very difficult to prosecute them because you can't connect them to a specific drug load, and so they're often just, um, you know, processed as uh, somebody who's just here illegally. Uh, so this was brought to our attention. We actually introduced a bill related to spotter activity, uh, simply making it a federal crime uh, in order to be a spotter and aiding and abetting cartel operations in this way. So I just want to highlight uh, at your thoughts and also, Mr. Del Cuarto, on the the, the trends that you've seen related to spotters. Chairman McSally, uh, you're exactly right when it comes to catching them is the, the biggest obstacle. When we catch our helicopter, uh, sees them up on the top of the mountains, and it's very difficult to see, but when you do see them, just catch them is the other half of it. They run off, and it's very, very hard to, to catch them. I have a one rancher down there that actually has a camera that's on the me that looks onto the Mexico side. <coughs> it's a border ranch that there's a house on top of the mountain, and that scouter watches everything on that southwest border and <laughs> uh, in that area and directs that traffic around. And we watch them all the time on that camera. Mm -hmm. And um, But we know they're in coaching our ranch patrol deputies, uh, ride their horses, ride right up on them, and they run, and we get them. And it is tough. It's very tough. I will say this, though, uh, as a solution-based thought, is uh, that our new border team that was put together in the first two years, they had 400 apprehensions. Now, this is a team of uh, about four Border Patrol agents and about four deputies that work part-time that have been tremendous in their efforts to get these smugglers, to get these um, scouts off these mountains and all these uh, ranch lands. So 400, about half of that was just pure illegals that were turned over to Border Patrol. The other half were smugglers, um, burglar suspects that broke into homes, you name it. And uh, we have 100% prosecution at the state level. One thing that we did here a few months ago, the county attorney and I, we sat down with Arizona's uh, attorney general and said, you have to step up the game here. You have to help us. I mean, our juvenile prosecutions is financially hurting us and straining us. And the answer was, I can't. There's no teeth in the law at the federal side, which obviously puts a burden back onto local, which is no financial support for that. But it's the right thing to do. And since in the last three months, I believe it's been, we've had 51 go through my jail, juvenile backpackers. And that's sad. It's very sad, but it's real in our county. And I know Yuma County, Pima, Santa Cruz are dealing with the same thing I am. So that's, that's where the local government has to be supported. Or the other thing we're talking about, and we talked to him about, our Arizona youth attorney was, you got to hire more prosecutors. I mean, you can't put just the enforcement component, support, support that, and not the, the jails, the the defense, the prosecution, all has to be a balanced approach in the criminal justice system, and then the education prevention side of it, too. Great, thank you. Mr. Del Cuarto? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, sure. Me? Related to scouts and spotters, and are you seeing yes. any trends with them using them? Um, working this job since 2003, um, I like to use examples, because, I, I mean, I just can't throw it out. I'm going to give you an example. Um, approximately uh, th three years ago, we apprehended some individuals, and uh, they had uh, 1,600 pounds of marijuana. When we apprehended these individuals, they were pretty far, they were about 20 miles into the United States. 
um, we debriefed, we spoke to them, and they did uh, admit that there was uh, close to uh, 15 different spotters along that area. So a 20 mile span, there was 15 different spotters. Mm -hmm. I think one spotter is too many. Yeah. 15 spotters, that's just ridiculous. Um, and these spotters, they do stay up there for months at a time. They have in different individuals, both from uh, the Mexican side and uh, citizens of this country that go up these hills and they provide them with food, they provide them with uh, drugs, and uh, we have information that at times they even pr provide them with uh, women to go up there and uh, take care of them while they're waiting for the uh, drugs to come through. That's just amazing. And that is just, I think it's unacceptable as, as a Border Patrol agent, it's unacceptable as a, a union leader for the, the agents that I represent, and frankly, it should be uh, unacceptable by any citizen of this country. Are you guys told not to go when you know they're up there, not to go up there and get them, or when yeah. you get them, we just, as your it's hands are tied as to what to do with them? It's just hard to determine where they're at. Yeah. It, that's, that's the problem. It's hard to determine exactly where they're at. And then when, when many times when we go to these areas, um, we, by the time we hump up the hill, they hear us coming, they're humping down the other side. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a cat and mouse every day. Yeah. Sounds like a little error support may be helpful for situational awareness during uh, operations like that? that w I mean, that would be nice. Um, we understand that it's limited on air support in certain areas also. Um, it's we need a lot of help out there. Great point. Um, I, I wanna get everybody's opinions on uh, interior checkpoints. I know there's gonna be uh, differences of opinion within this panel and with the next panel, but I, I wanna give everybody the opportunity uh, to share their perspectives on how how those uh, impact uh, the security operations or any other impacts uh, related to your your roles, Sheriff Channels? Well, it's become a cultural norm in our county to have to go through a checkpoint and claim your citizenship as an American. And I hear that all the time from the citizens, uh, how that is. Though it's real to us, uh, maybe not real to downtown Maricopa County or other parts of this country, but it's real to us. The other thing as a local sheriff that's important is the fact that Every time you establish a international port out away from the border, it becomes, we have one, in, give you example, Whetstone area, which is north of Sierra Vista. That's the international port of Whetstone because what happens is these smugglers, they know when the checkpoint's open based on scouting reports. Uh, when it is open, they drop their uh, smuggling product, whether it be humans or dope, and they go around the checkpoint into these communities and guess who gets called on it? We do. Again, another burden on us, and it's tough for us because those are a long time, and that's why we work so close with Border Patrol because trying to get out there, we have an air, uh, air support that helps us, but again, it, it's tough, it's challenging. The biggest complaint I hear is, is since the border's not secure in the rural parts, and then we have secondary checkpoints, it, it's kind of counterproductive. You got the primary focus should be on the border. Once that's uh, secured to a point where the stakeholders are satisfied. I don't know if it'll ever be perfectly. I've never seen perfect on our border. I don't know if I ever will. But then we can work on secondary. So um, it's a big challenge. A lot of complaints on it, I'll be honest with you. A lot of complaints. Mayor Ortega? I, I agree with Sheriff Donalds. I think, well, first, they're not open 24 sevens if it's raining or sometimes the weather's inclement, they, they close the, the checkpoint. Uh, but it does put a burden on the community surrounding the checkpoints themselves. I agree with Sheriff Donalds and I'd rather see the agents closer to the border and, and stopping the, the problems at the border versus 25, 40 miles out. Mr. Del Sarco? If members of this panel and, and different members of law enforcement have said before that they do not believe that the border will ever be secure, and you bring all the agents down to the border, if this border is never gonna be secure, what do you do with the people that go do go around it? That's why these, these checkpoints are important. You wanna sacrifice having a checkpoint in these communities send all the agents to the border. What happens if something gets through us? What happens when they go through these roads, through these main roads down on 90, through the main roads over here out off, off of uh, Wilcox and Tombstone area? No gallus. They, they, they serve a purpose. They serve a good purpose. They help derail, they help uh, deter some of these traffic that comes through. Um, there was a time where we would see an astro astronomical amount of uh, vehicles up on I-10 headed towards Phoenix. Um, it, they serve a purpose. Okay, I'd like to follow up on that and then I'll hand it over to Mr. Mr. Pierce is, I mean, my understanding from talking to 
uh, individuals within Border Patrol and the community. This defense in depth, which includes the interior checkpoints in, in both of our districts, right, because we have in New Mexico as well, uh, was based originally on, uh, again, the strategy of pushing the activity into the rural areas like we talked about, but then not having enough resources to be able to really, you know, intercept it very quickly. Uh, and with limited resources, uh, you know, the, the best way to address that is to figure out how to funnel the illegal activity in a place that we can monitor and intercept at a time and place of our choosing uh, is, is the way the strategy has been described to me. Uh, I, I may not be parroting it back perfectly, uh, but I've heard, um, again, from individuals in leadership positions in CBP that they feel they have seconds to minutes to intercept activity in urban areas, and they say hours to days to intercept it in, in rural areas. And so, therefore, this defense in depth strategy, which includes the interior checkpoints, uh, the, what was described to me is that the primary role of the interior checkpoints is to make the cartels go around them. I mean, the low-level criminals and others are gonna you know, get the Darwin Award by coming through a known uh, law enforcement checkpoint with drugs, which I still don't totally understand. But uh, those that are actually the serious traffickers are gonna uh, go, go around, which then, again, pushes the activity into maybe more difficult terrain, which might be easier for you all to corner them. The challenge with all that that we'll hear, we've heard from some of this panel and we've heard from the second panel, I know we won't have the interaction, but I hear that, that all might sound reasonable if you didn't have people living in those areas between where they cross and where you can eventually intercept them 50, 100 miles inland. And so it's that public safety threat of those that are living in those areas that are then having the traffic funneled into them, which is, is the main point of feedback that I'm getting really across the board. And so I guess I hear what you're saying, that if you, if you don't have enough resources that maybe you do need to fall back and have, sorry to use the football analogy you all no. hate, but everybody's playing safety, you know, instead of being at the line of scrimmage. But if you had the resources that you needed, if we were using intelligence-driven operations, if we were detecting the cartel activity and knowing their, um, you know, their, their lines of activity, and by the way, being nimble, because as soon as you, as soon as you squeeze them, they move somewhere else, They've, they become much more nimble than, than we are generally, because we're more bureaucratic. So if you had all those resources and you had the ability, the vehicles, the ATVs, the horse, the air assets, to be able to quickly intercept them right at the border, would you then agree? I'm not trying to get you to agree, but I'm trying to find areas of common ground. If we had the resources, do you, would you agree that it is better to intercept them at the border with maybe a couple safeties as opposed to our fallback where we're at right now, which is based on a lack of resources? And are you, I mean, can you, can you understand the concerns that we have of law, law enforcement in the community that the public safety challenge happens because all that space is ceded and that's what creates the, the threats to individuals in our community if we're focused on intercepting so far inland? I agree with what you say, but I think one of the big things that you did say is you still need the safety to catch that path. And that's the big A couple deal. of them. You I think you have two you, you, on a you team, right? You yeah. still need those. Right. I mean, that's, that's honestly, that's what you still need. Okay. Um, I mean, that's, and that's and would you thing. consider the checkpoints to be those if we had the resources to intercept quickly and have you guys be able to uh, nimbly uh, intercept at the border? Would you still think we would need these interior checkpoints? Yes, because things are still going to get through. And these checkpoints help out a lot of that. We have noticed that with the checkpoints there, our apprehensions have uh, uh, helped considerably in those areas. Yes, they move to more uh, rural areas, but the agents are out there to intercept uh, those spots. The, I mean, the, I mean, it's you're, you're, we're pretty much what we're saying is, um, if we get enough people at the border, then we don't need the checkpoints, but we're still gonna have things that go through. Um, so when you would tell me, uh, get rid of some of these checkpoints, First and foremost, that's not up to me to get rid of. Um, second of all, um, we still need some of these checkpoints. So, I mean, I'm not gonna sit here and agree we need to get rid of them. We still need some of them. Uh, which ones they are, that would be up to the agency to decide on that. But I, I can tell you that uh, some of the issues that we have at these checkpoints is I understand that the, 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 the people that live in these areas are fed up with the checkpoints. Um, a lot of times when they come through these checkpoints, it would make it so much easier both on them and on the agent. Um, it's a simple, are you a United States citizen? Yes, I am. Have a good day. And a lot of these times, they'll refuse to lower their window. Uh, they'll, they'll get confrontational with the agent. There's a lot of back and forth. And, and you know, this, these agents, like we spoke earlier, they live within the communities too. 
you know these agents are just out there doing their job right. and, and that's what a lot of the people need to understand they're not here to give anyone a hard time they're here to do their job that's it they're here to protect these uh, our borders they're here to make sure that whatever gets through the border is is properly intercepted it's properly screened and that our communities are not just safer along the border but throughout the united states that's the agent's job at these checkpoints thank you chris pierce thank you i thought i was gonna move off of the question a little bit uh, no such luck but <laughs> we uh because you're saying some stimulating things i might listen or not listen to the words you're saying because uh, frankly i had a much different opinion about the interior checkpoints but i can hear the passion and the intensity and when I see someone who has established a credibility here today that you've established in front of this, this group, then, then I pay attention when people are invested in something. So we might not agree on it, but uh, we would sit at the table if it were just this group trying to solve a problem. Uh, I'm gonna switch over to, to, the, uh, to the sheriff. So people s who wanna push the argument that the border is secure, and there are a lot in Washington who wanna push that. So I have a simple question. Uh, is the price of drugs going up dramatically in the street? Because really drugs are like anything else. They're, they're a commodity. And if the supply is being squeezed off as dramatically as being talked about in Washington, then the price would be skyrocketing. So are you seeing a skyrocketing price in drugs? Or, or not, actually with heroin, it's actually gone down. Yeah, so there's, so there's uh, too much supply, it's coming in too readily and the price is going down. Correct. Now, the, um, so the access uh, through public lands is again, heated debate. Uh, the president just through executive order declared much of, of the, uh, the border area in New Mexico as a, as a monument, wilderness, whatever, they're all the same. So is the Oregon Pike National Monument, is that still got the signs up there requesting people not to go in there, American citizens saying you should not go here because it's just too dangerous? I haven't been on that. I, I, uh, um, Mr. Del Cueto, you happen to know that? It's, so we're getting a head shake out from the audience. Are these guys respectable behind you, the ones <laughs> that keep coming in with them? <laughs> I'm just joking. I, I <laughs> but I'm getting head shakes out there. I don't know who those people are. Okay, I, I don't identify them. They're yeah. not identifying you at this stage. I haven't seen, I, I, don't know, <laughs> I don't know if it's there yet. I, I mean, I honestly don't but know it, if it's still there. But the idea is it's still very dangerous in the Oregon Pike. Correct. And somebody yes. forgot to tell the drug smugglers and the illegal aliens that they're yeah. not supposed to walk on that land. They can't get on the wilderness area. Yeah, I was the uh, chair of the subcommittee on national parks, and so we t toured a lot of these. When we went out to the uh, the redwood uh, forest, whatever that is out there, uh, they actually have, they're, they're mining, uh, they're planting marijuana back in the forest, in the Sequoia National Forest so far that, that they've, just to tell backpackers you can't go beyond here because you're gonna hit a tripwire and the shotgun they have laying out there on the rail trail is gonna blow your head off. So they actually stop, stop the traffic because we grow so much marijuana in our national forest that the law enforcement officers can't get there. And you, uh, Sheriff, you don't have free access to chase people who are doing illegal stuff. You gotta go through some bureaucratic process to go in and, and check illegal activity. Well, in, in our forest lands, we don't ask. <laughs> if there's a crime, we go we go, whether it be an accident, whether it be a search and rescue. Okay, but say there's not a crime. Say that you have to just, say you've got a suspicion that uh, they're making methamphetamines out there in the middle of nowhere. Can you just go out? We do, yes. Okay. Uh, it's part of Cochise County. I think every sheriff you ask would say the same thing, is if there's a crime within this county, excluding a military reservation, uh, we go, we go. Okay, but I'm asking if you don't know there's a crime, can you go out there just to investigate? If we don't know there's a crime. If you suspect, if, if you got somebody coming north out of the, the area and you suspect that there's probably something out there that needs to be looked at, do you just go on out there or do you have to clear it with the agency? We go out there. All we, right, we okay, there. it's a different story than I hear most of the time. Yeah, we, we do. We, we have a, pr um, and this is where it's important for the locals working with their federal partners and their federal leaders within the county boundaries uh, we all know each other very well, and if there's enough respect, we just go, and we work close with them. If we need to get them involved, we will, but we don't let that stop us, is my point okay. to this whole conversation. Mr. Del Cueto, just an observation. I'm just working my way down through the list, so I'm kind of bouncing around a little here. But uh, I was in the hearing when uh, 
Department of Homeland Security, Secretary Napolitano testified in Congress, and we had probably eight border sheriffs disputing her testimony, and she simply said they're lying. I mean, that was really, really, really not a good position for her to establish because I keep hearing the truth out here, and I'm hearing the truth from you. But that's what makes it very difficult in Washington is that, that people, they get to a certain level and they have their established things that they're going to say regardless of what the truth is. And for uh, Sheriff San Maniego, I remember him. He was probably 90 at the point. He, w he was there testifying, been in law enforcement for 50 years and, and was dramatic, dramatic. And, and to hear that exchange where she just said, uh, you can't trust him is, is not good. Would drones help you out when you're going up the side of the hill? and they're going down the other side, the drone could be sitting up here, and so you have somebody else waiting on the other side, you can see where they're going. I mean, that's what we're doing in Afghanistan, right? Right, the, the, it's the bottom line is that though, we can have the drones up there, and we'd have, we have drones in certain areas, mm -hmm. but it's getting the manpower to go out there and arrest these individuals that the drones are seeing. Mm -hmm. That seems to be a big problem. Okay. Um, a lot, like I said earlier, a lot of our agents are farmed out. So those farm outs, we discussed that a minute ago. Mm -hmm. We went from 10,000, 12,000 up to 23, more or less. Are those productive farm outs or would they be better off brought back and put on the, the border uh, like, uh, like I would recommend, but that might not be a good idea. What is your internal view? You, I, I mean, and that you'd have to speak to the agency and speak to the other agencies uh, and the agencies that we're farming them out to. So I know there's agents that are farmed out uh, at the ports. There's some agents that are farmed out for DEA. There's agents that are farmed out um, at the prosecution's office. Okay. So All right. So uh, again, as I would visit with agents out in the field, they said, okay, I spend about three hours a day on the border. The rest of the time is in, in paperwork. If I catch somebody, it takes me six or seven hours to do the paperwork. Is that more or less accurate even if the numbers change pretty dramatically that you catch them and then you got to go in and do the paperwork it depends on uh, the individuals we catch but on the average you know you, you never know it just depends on if they have priors mm -hmm. uh, obviously with some of these catch and release you're not spending much time doing paperwork mm -hmm. the because it seems like that it takes a very special person to be there on the border and then we put you on paperwork which is not so special I mean I could do paperwork I could do your job but I could do <coughs> paperwork uh, and and we take you with valuable, valuable capabilities and put you in doing what a clerk could do, frankly. And yes, I know there, you know, you got to do some legal things. Well, you're right. So is that a possibility that, that we could redirect? Um, that's one of the reasons I, I, I spoke about the FOBs. I know a lot of money has been spent on these FOBs. They're in remote areas. Uh, many times when these agents apprehend individuals in these remote areas, it would be easily accessible to go to these FOBs and do the processing from the FOB um, and do all the paperwork there. That way you're still close to the border and be able to move around. And that would be, uh, I mean, I think it would be a huge asset. Um, do you ever have the top managers in the department come down and ask you all how to, how to solve the problems of assets and how to secure the border? Do you have Secretary of Homeland Security ever come down here and ask you all sitting right there? You know, uh, Commissioner Kurlikowski was here last week, mm -hmm. and it's the first time I've ever seen him in Tucson sector since he's been in that position. Is he asking you what it would take? I mean, if I was up there, I guarantee if I was, if I was running a business that, that required securing the border, I'd be out here talking to people every day and making adjustments and, you know, putting the, putting the linebackers in or whatever the chairman's talking about over here. But uh, honestly, he spoke, and um, he answered three questions, and that was it. Yeah, that's, that's again what I find. The system is broken from Congress all the way across. Every system in Washington is absolutely broken because they don't ask the people who are there. I'm gonna wrap up with one friendly question. Uh, uh, Mayor, I'm yes, thinking sir. about, sp I've got two questions actually. I'm thinking about spending a little bit of money before I fly back to Washington this evening and I may run out and get a haircut and I need to know who you <laughs> use <laughs> to get your haircuts from. <laughs> I'll do that in Douglas and then, uh, but. My wife gives me mine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, well just I last I night. I don't guess I'll do that. <laughs> no. I'll go to the airport and get a shoe shine instead. <laughs> we, uh, so you, um, so you hear the push. And I know that business is big deal and, and I'm a business guy and I really, uh, I respect that, I appreciate it, I appreciate your voice here today. 
do you find that y you're a little bit alarmed by the testimony coming around you that it might, that their uh, testimony might influence people that they want to secure the border too much and they begin to, to interrupt the uh, economic activity or do you see that all, all can be done, that we can, we can have those wide open gates and, and, and still secure the border? Do you, are you, is that a thing that you get alarmed about? You see where I'm coming from? Because if they dominate the discussions and yours is left off on the side, then we begin to squeeze down business for security. So, so tell me a little bit about where you are there, and I'm gonna. That'll be the last question I have, Madam Chair. Yes, actually, I am. I am concerned with this because I think a lot of times, especially election years, mm -hmm. the border is painted in a very negative tone. Where there's a lot of good things that happen mm -hmm. with uh, within our own communities, uh, culturally, with sports, with so many events, with the goods that are crossing on a daily basis that support our economy locally, but also the economy of the United States of America. And we are Americans. I think this payback a bit, we're protecting the Phoenixes, the Tucsons, but there's a lot of us that live at the border, have lived there for generations. And sometimes I don't think we feel quite like Americans because we're, we're kind of like ignored in many cases and we'll deal with the problem behind us, but what about on the front line? Mm -hmm. But we worry about commerce. We worry about people coming to visit. We are losing population with in Cochise County and we encourage people to come visit. I think Congressman McSally has been to Douglas many times. I don't think she's ever had any issues. Uh, we've gone out to many fine Mexican restaurants and uh, never worry about things. Um, but I do understand the issues of the outline areas as well. Yeah, you don't disregard them. It's no, just that not you would all. want an equal seat at the table saying, fine, let's solve the problem, but also remember that commerce has got to occur. Yes, sir, and that's why I'm appreciative of being invited here today yeah. so you do hear the other side of the story. Yeah. Thank you. Now, I grew up in 4-H and made my way through uh, college showing pigs and all I got to say if you move 1500 cows a day across that border you're doing something right yeah, so keep moving cow. those cows thank you uh, well thanks uh, yeah as a follow-up that I that is why why you're here why all of you are here and I appreciate it uh, one last quick question uh, Mr. Del Quinto before we go to the second panel I just want to give you the opportunity you mentioned uh, agents uh, moving in uh, places in order to protect ranchers. Uh, can you just give your perspective on the relationship between Border Patrol agents and ranchers right now and anything that uh, you know could uh, improve those relationships and the communication? Well, you know, um, I work on the Tahana Autumn Reservation. So I work with some of them ranchers down there. Um, but I do, like I said, a lot of my constituents work in the Naco area and throughout the Cochise County. And uh, just the feel is, uh, it, it's really, not um, a banging heads with the ranchers. The agents are out there doing their job. It's not, or it's, it is? it's not a banging, okay. he banging their heads with them is what I'm getting from the agents. Um, but there's certain areas that are closed off to border patrol agents. Um, that, that's what the, the message that's being sent to them, that they can't work certain areas. So if you track a group um, near the border into uh, these individuals' lands, uh, you can't go in their land so what you have to do is you have to drive around the entire area of their land and try to intercept them on the northern part. By the time you get there, a lot of the, these individuals are already gone. And, and, and that's a serious problem. Another thing is if, uh, if we encounter some of these individuals and we go on their land because we're actively following this group and uh, God forbid something would happen on this land where we would need air support or we would need medical attention, um, not just to ourselves but also to the individuals we would apprehend, uh, there's, it would be uh, very limited and it'd be uh, very difficult to get these uh, emergency vehicles on this land to assist any kind of injured individual. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, we're done with panel one. Thanks for everybody's uh, patience. I wanna thank the witnesses uh, for your testimony today and uh, for the good discussion and questions. Um, there may be some follow-up questions. I don't know if you think of some. Uh, that our, per our procedures, they'll submit them in writing and then we'll ask you guys to respond in writing if we have those. Uh, so with that, I'll dismiss the first panel. Thanks for your testimony and your time. I uh, request that the clerk prepare the witness panel for our second table, and then we'll start again.
All right, we're going to get started again. I'm pleased to welcome five distinguished witnesses for our second panel in today's hearing. First, Mr. Dan Bell, who's the president of ZZ Cattle Corporation in Nogales, Arizona. Mr. Bell and his family work on his ranch, and have, uh, the ranch has been in his family since 1938, and they share a 10-mile boundary line with the U.S.-Mexico border. He's also served as the president of the Southern Arizona Cattlemen Protective Association and is currently serving as past president of the Arizona Cattle Growers Association. Uh, Mr. Mark Adams is the coordinator of Frontera de Cristo, a Presbyterian border ministry located in the sister cities of Agua Prieta, Sonora, and Douglas, Arizona. Mr. Adams is a native of, I should be calling you Pastor Adams, shouldn't I? Of, Clo of, of Clover, South Carolina, and a graduate of Columbia Theological Seminary in Decatur, Georgia. He was ordained in 1998 and has served as a U.S. coordinator of Frontera de Cristo since that time. Uh, Mr. Jaime Chamberlain is the president of uh, Nogales, Arizona-based JC Distributing Incorporated, an importer of Mexican fruits and vegetables. Uh, Jaime is the past chairman of the board of directors of the Fresh Produce Association of the Americas and is a uh, sponsor member of the Nogales Santa Cruz County Port Authority. He was recently appointed by Governor Ducey to the Arizona Rural Economic Development Advisory Council and the Board of Directors of the Arizona Mex Mexico Commission, where he serves as co-chairman of the Ports and Transportation Infrastructure Committee. Mrs. Nan Stockholm Walden serves as the Vice President and Counsel at, at Farmers Investment Company, the largest pecan growing and processing farm in the world located in Sahuita, Arizona. During her career, Nan served as counsel to the U.S. Senate Environment and Public Works Committee and counsel for Senator Dan Patrick Moynihan on the Water Resources Subcommittee. She was chief of staff for Senator Bill Bradley, who served on the Senate Finance and Energy and Natural Resources Committees. She has also been an associate vice president for federal relations at the University of Arizona in Tucson. And Mr. Frank Krentz is the son of Rob Krentz, who was tragically gunned down as he was trying to help an immigrant in 2010. Mr. Krentz has been working in the family ranch in Cochise County since his graduation from New Mexico State University. He's involved with the Apache School Board, Malpai Borderlands Group, Arizona Cattle Growers, Right Water Draw Conservation District, and the Vice President of the Arizona Association's Conservation Districts. The Chair now recognizes Mr. Bell. Well, good morning, Chairman McSally and Congressman Pierce. Thank you for coming down and thank you for holding this uh, subcommittee hearing. Um, it's an issue that's very important to ranchers who live along the border or even near the border. Uh, again, my name is Daniel Bell. I'm a third generation rancher from Nogales, Arizona. Our family has been ranching the same piece of country since the late 1930s. We're located just west of the city of Nogales and we have 10 miles of border that we share with Mexico. Of that, two miles of that border has a bollard style fence or what you'd call a border wall. Uh, the remaining eight miles is a four strand barbed wire cattle fence. Um, our ranch is subject to the impacts of illegal immigration and drug smuggling on a daily basis. In the 1990s, border operations in California and Texas essentially forced illegal border uh, traffic into Arizona. Uh, as a result, Arizona border cities were fortified, forcing the illegal activity onto the adjacent ranches. Uh, and we began seeing the UDA groups increase from you know, groups of one or two to groups of 50 or more at that time. Um, as a result these of these increases, the, the ranches were heavily impacted. Um, we had uh, damage being done to our fences. Our watering facilities were damaged and drained uh, very often. Uh, our vehicles are stolen, homes are broken into, and valuables are taken. Also since then, the frequency of fire has increased on the ranches along the border as a result of warming fires that have been let go. Um, fires lit by UDAs uh, in distress and fires lit by drug smugglers as, as to create a distraction or, uh, or, yeah, or diversion, I should say. Um, we have had a house burned to the ground and in 2011, approximately two thirds of our ranch was burned from 13 different fires um, that year. In fact, just this past Tuesday, there was a fire started by illegals uh, on the western portion of our ranch. Uh, Border Patrol was able to apprehend the individuals and uh, call in the fire. Forest Service was able to get on it rapidly and get it put out. Violence in the border region was also uh, on an increase. In 1998, while apprehending drug smugglers, Border Patrol agent Alexander Kirpnik was murdered in one of our grazing pastures. A decade later, border agents were taking fire and some agents were even wounded in sniper style shootings near the border. In March of 2010, my friend Rob Krentz was murdered on his ranch in Cochise County doing what 
Frank and I still do to this day, checking our pastures and checking our cattle. Um, one month later, the foreman of the ranch neighboring us in Mexico was found murdered and buried in a shallow grave, and he had been missing for over a month. Later that year, Border Patrol agent Brian Terry was murdered on our neighbor's ranch just to the north of us. Uh, while he, he and his BORTAC team were working to rid the area of violent rip crews that were targeting illegal aliens and drug smugglers. The facts I have uh, just stated were the breaking points that caused ranchers along the border to demand more border security resources and more boots on the ground. It's been my experience that improvement can happen with better access and by establishing roads along the international boundary with Mexico. Being able to get to the border is paramount if one expects to defend it. With better access, good border, a good border road system in place, next generation technologies like uh, remote video surveillance system towers uh, that are capable of detecting movement within their field of view, uh, as well as radar equipped mobile surveillance capable vehicles, uh, as well as uh, uh, integrated fixed towers uh, could be put into place. Um, this technology can detect movement and focus in on that movement to maximize efficiency by verifying if a response is necessary and if so, providing the critical situational awareness needed. Better access and roads along the border would place law enforcement efforts closer to the line of scrimmage and reduce the footprint of the illegal activity, which is a positive for the environment. Where access is limited and roads are non-existent, it is extremely important that air assets like helicopters are available to insert agents into rugged and remote areas and provide support for agents on the ground. Fixed wing aircraft and drones must also be readily available to detect and respond to illegal activity and direct law enforcement to intercept points and provide a much needed situational awareness. And of course, having more boots on the ground in the right place at the right time in order to intercept the illegal activity is critical. Some of the other measures include increasing horse patrols in the rugged and remote areas where access is limited, include the uh, use of military personnel in the border security mission. Establish a better communications and technology, not only for law enforcement, but for the civilians that are out there as well. And establish more forward operating bases to cut travel and response times to incidents. Fund state and federal uh, attorney's offices to assure timely prosecution of border related offenses and ensure that the judicial resources are in place to provide consequences uh, to offenders. We need to figure out a, a, a set of metrics that will maintain resource levels even after we see improvement because what tends to happen is as you get improvement, we tend to pull resources away and then we, we're, we're stuck with the same problem. Uh, one of the things that's worked very well for us uh, in the Nogales area is pro the, the citizen advisory boards and the rancher liaison programs and I also see that as a valuable metric because we can see what's happening and we can relay, relay that information to uh, law enforcement. Over time, I have witnessed improvement in certain areas, and it has coincided with the implementation of some of the measures that I've mentioned to you today. It's only on a small portion of our ranch, but we need to keep working and keep bringing those, uh, those uh, uh, measures into place. And I uh, thank you for allowing me the time to come and address you today. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Bell. The chair now recognizes Pastor Adams. Thank you, Chair McSally and Representative Pierce uh, for the opportunity to be here. As I push th the button, I see that I'm talking with a Shure microphone. Uh, Twenty-some years ago, my wife, Miriam Maldonado Escobar, migrated from Chiapas, Mexico, uh, after her family could no longer farm uh, on corn farms there because of the price of corn dropping and come, came to the border to work for Shure. Uh, they had a factory uh, on the U.S.-Mexico US border in Aguapeta, Sonora, and so she's uh, sure is part of the reason that, that I got the love of my life. Um, for me, um, I've been living on the border of the U.S. and Mexico for 18 years. For the first 18 years of my life, I lived on the border between uh, Clo uh, South Carolina and North Carolina, quite different borders. Um, but also the border on between the U.S. and Mexico is also quite different now than it was 20 years ago. 25 years ago, 30 years ago. It's very different. It's changed dramatically. Um, what is the border for me? The border is home. The border is a place that I love. The border is a place where 12 million other folks uh, live 
uh, and I imagine love as well. So the border is home. And so as you all undertake uh, the task of uh, making laws and, and trying to oversee the policies uh, that make our border secure, uh, I really want to encourage you to always remember that the border is home. It is home to me, and it is home to millions of others. Too often the border has been seen as a place uh, to defend, to be afraid of, uh, as, a pl as opposed to a place to, to revitalize, uh, to a place to, to see as an asset, a place of encounter. Um, and for me, that's what the border is. Unfortunately, I, I'm, um, I'm afraid that at times um, our attempts to secure the border uh, for whatever fear we might have has negatively impacted the local communities on the border. Um, uh, as Mr. Pierce uh, saw with Mayor Danny uh, Ortega, the town of Douglas is, is secure uh, in the sense of crossings and um, crime, but also at times uh, for us to have a secure border, we also have to have the secure and safe and efficient flow of people through our borders. And so for many, many years, we have neglected that part. And so as we've secured our border between ports of entry, or tried to, uh, we've neglected securing our community security and our economic security. And so I want to encourage you to think about the importance of that aspect of border security as you undergo your task um, there. Also, um, as you seek to do your task to secure our borders, please do not sacrifice the civil rights of our home, of our community, of our people. I was serving with um, a group of folks who came down uh, from the Border Action Network because they wanted to meet some of the folks from the community uh, in Douglas to see how, what it was their relationship with the increased um, enforcement in our community and if there were any problems. And I said, sure, I'll go around the communities with you. And as we were going, someone asked me, um, well, Mark, have you had any problems with your local uh, Border Patrol? No. I said, we meet on a regular basis. They're very helpful. It's one, you, you've never had any problems. He said, I said, well, there was that time where I was driving uh, the Frontera Cristo van and I got stopped three times within 45 minutes. And that was a little strange. And then there was a time where I picked up a friend of mine from the Philippines at the shuttle and I got followed back uh, to our office and the car sat in front of our office. And when I went out and I said, excuse me, can I help you? They said, um, we heard that there's a smuggling ring going on here. Uh, I said, no, that's all right. And that was kind of strange. And then there was a time, and I went off and I rattled off five times uh, where I experienced something very different than I would ever experience in South Carolina and North Carolina. And I say that as a white man uh, who has 20 years of education, a formal education, who is a U.S. citizen, who speaks English, uh, who has a national church at its back. And the reality is many of our community who don't have those same privileges that I have n no... <laughs> There's no reason I should have them and others not uh, face realities that are dangerous for our community security. Uh, and we need to improve our relationship with our local law enforcement. And finally, I want to say that we need to take death out of the immigration equation. Too many people have died in our deserts uh, because we've used, uh, we've used deserts and mountains as lethal deterrents. They've been lethal but not deterrents. And that doesn't uphold who we are as a nation. And we need to always remember uh, that we have, you have the challenge of securing our, our borders, but also up upholding the legacy of us as a nation of immigrants. And so I want to please ask you, think about the security of the tired, the poor, the huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Take them out of the drug equation. Take them out and allow for a, a safe and efficient flow of people through ports of entry to, to decrease the the suffering and the death that occurs because of policies that are harming folks who can no longer make a, a living or are trying to be reunited with family. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Pastor Adams. The chair now recognizes Mr. Chamberlain. Chairwoman McSally and Rep Representative Pierce, my name is Jaime Chamberlain. I am president of JC Distributing, a Nogales, Arizona-based company with a 46-year history of importing and distributing fresh produce from Mexico throughout the United States and Canada. I appreciate the opportunity to speak about my community and my industry as it pertains to border security. 
For the last 29 years, I have worked alongside with my family, our dedicated employees, and our grower partners to feed North America. This is a bold statement, but this is our mission and this is our passion. As a Nogales resident and as an American businessman, I believe that I bring a background and close to three decades of professional experience that allows me to assure you that my comments before you today are based on the realities of the border and the realities of North American trade and investment. I am a big proponent of efforts and initiatives to promote trade and tourism in Southern Arizona for the benefit of my state and for my country. I am also an ardent proponent of enhanced security at our border's rural areas as well as at our ports of entry. Let me assure you that these two positions are not contradictory, but in fact they are essential and complementary. The more effective and efficient that our enforcement agencies are at the border, the faster our produce, our manufactured goods, our cattle, our mining equipment, and our Mexican consumers can cross the border. With enhanced security, our enforcement officials can, with greater certainty, secure our communities and bolster our economic productivity. As a lifelong border citizen, I feel it is my responsibility to articulate the truth about life on the border. We have a distinct and unique physical security challenges all along our state, as many before me have testified to. But our businesses also require a safe and secure environment so that we may focus on the future of our economic viability. The stability of economic competitiveness strengthens our homeland against those who may want to disrupt our way of life. Nogales, a community of 24,000 people, is the principal gateway for Arizona's trade and tourism with Mexico. As reported by the federal government in 2015, Nogales processed 319,000 trucks, 3.5 million cars, 10.5 million people. But I wanna make sure that everyone understands that these are only northbound crossing statistics. When we add our southbound crossings, our numbers are staggering considering our small population. The reality is that our ports of entry at Nogales processed 640,000 trucks, 7 million cars, and 21 million people this past year alone. These numbers represent more than $25 billion worth of imports and exports flowing through Nogales each year. And once you include Douglas and San Luis, these numbers easily exceed $30 billion worth of cross-border trade. It is also estimated that Mexican vi visitors spend over $7.3 million per day in Arizona. What happens at Nogales is important to Arizona and to the nation. Thanks to the efforts of many stock stakeholders in our community, among them the Greater Nogales Santa Cruz County Port Authority and the Fresh Produce Association of the Americas, close to $300 million has been invested in our community. Our commercial crossings have some of the shortest wait times of any commercial and comparable port of entry on the borders of Canada and Mexico. We have improved our situation in many ways over the last 10 years, but we still have much more we that needs to be done. These volumes can continue to grow, but only if we provide customs and border protection, the necessary staffing, the newest technology for our equipments, and the state-of-the-art facilities in which to do their job effectively and efficiently. Currently, CBP is doing the best they can protecting our interests with what they have. This is not acceptable for the citizens of Arizona, nor for the citizens of the United States of America. We can do better for those brave men and women in green and blue uniforms. We can do better for the businessmen and women working in our communities and we certainly can do better for our future citizens. This is the paradigm that I am asking you to change. The U.S. government, combined with your leadership in Congress, needs to commit the necessary resources for our ports of entry. This is an urgent matter for our physical and for our economic security. Securing the border at the border should be the strategy for our country Unfortunately, many times when we ask for resources for our border, 
we are seen as a cost burden to the nation. I don't know of a better use of scarce federal, federal funds than investing in our seaports, our land ports, and our airports of entry. It needs to be seen, it must be seen as our best return on our investment for our nation by ensuring that our ports of entry are of the highest service standard for our foreign and domestic consumers, we would assure a more prosperous economic future for North America. A new report from the research arm of the University of Southern California links Customs and Border Protection officer staffing to both revenue generation and job creation. The National Center for Risk and Economic Analysis of Terrorism Events report released on April 8th of 2013 estimates the impact of wait times at major ports of entry on the U.S. economy due to changes in CBP officer staffing. The study concludes that adding one CBP officer at one of the study's lands or airport locations would inject $2 million into the economy and produce 33, million, 33 new jobs. Yet our Nogales ports of entry are understaffed by almost 300 agents and over 20 K-9 units. We must keep our ports working at the speed of business. We have not done so in many years. Efficient and well-staffed ports of entry mean foreign direct investment. It means job creation. It means higher paying exported related jobs. And it means we can feel safe while conducting our businesses with our northern, our southern, and our global trade partners. Madam Chairwoman and members of the committee, I thank you for the opportunity to share some of my thoughts with you. Be assured of my personal commitment to working with you and the other stakeholders in this room to make our border a true asset for our economic and physical security. I think you can tell how passionate I am about these issues. There's simply too much at stake to approach this in any other way. I look forward to your questions. Great, thank you, Mr. Chamberlain. Chair now recognizes Ms. Mrs. Stockholm Walden, please. Thank you, Chair McSally and Representative Pierce. On behalf of Farmers Investment Company and the Green Valley Pecan Company, I'm very grateful to be here this morning. Just under two weeks ago, I had the opportunity to testify in Washington before the uh, Oversight Subcommittee of the House Natural Resources Committee on a similar topic, border security and federal lands. My presence here today underscores how seriously we take these issues. Um, my husband is in California today, but he certainly joins me in these remarks. Uh, we were there with friends and local neighbors, Sue and Jim Chilton, and our hearts go out to the Krentz family and um, to the Bell families, whom we know very well also, as to what they're undergoing on a daily basis. You know, 2% of our population are farmers and ranchers, and they feed the world, not only this country, but the world. And um, you're part of that too, um, Jaime, and we're, we're grateful and, and share many of your observations. FICO is a major agricultural company founded almost 75 years ago by my father-in-law. Today, my husband and our two children um, are forming the third generation of Waldens, and we have many second and third generation workers, most of whom are of Mexican-American descent. We employ 260 full-time workers with full-time benefits, plus 50 to 60 seasonal workers during the harvest, which makes us one of the larger employers in Pima County. We also have major farms in Cochise County at San Simon, about 3,500 acres of pecans we're planting, a warehouse in Las Cruces, uh, New Mexico, so I guess uh, I represent several constituencies here. We're the largest integrated grower and processor of pecans in the world, and our pecans are known globally for their quality and value. The FICO headquarters is located just over 40 miles north of the border off of I-19, and our home ranch is just less than 30 miles. We have a horse and cattle operation with 160 acres of private land and a 6,000 acre state grazing lease that straddles the southern part of Pima County and, and the northern part of Santa Cruz County line, just north of the checkpoint at I-19. Our proximity to the border gives us firsthand experience with border security challenges, and we know the difficult job the Border Patrol is tasked to undertake. 
I've served on uh, former Representative Gabby Gifford's Citizens Advisor Group on the I-19 checkpoint, and um, I would like to request that their recommendations be made part of the record because I think they're very apropos for today as well. Without objection. Thank you. We would uh, concur that we should secure the border at the border. And this is not because of some romantic notion we have about the difficulties that we are all facing, but because we believe that um, too many alternate routes exist to get around the checkpoint. Um, you gave the football analogy. Another one of my friends who played football, Gary Brasher, says it's sort of like standing in the middle of the field if you're the defense and hoping the quarterback will run into your arms. We have a gas line, we have a dry riverbed, we have a, uh, different transmission lines and a railroad that are all excellent routes to go around the checkpoint. So what happens is, is people are flushed into our neighborhoods and ranches and communities and the Border Patrol itself admits that 94% of the apprehensions are not made at the checkpoint but around it. So it's a serious concern. Um, I believe, you know, you have a military background. My husband was a pilot in Vietnam, flew the OV-1 Mohawk. If for, you know, this is a fanciful example, but if Mexico declared war on America, the Marines would not hold the line in Tucson or Phoenix. They would defend the border at the border, at our sovereign border. They would go into Mexico if necessary to push them back. And that's the same approach that we feel that we need today. Um, we believe that comprehensive immigration reform is also essential for border security. This must be a multi-layered approach. We have to be smart about this. And I think Mayor uh, Ortega um, and others that you heard on the first panel all mentioned this. Our visa system, our temporary worker system is broken. Agriculture, ranching, the hospitality industry, healthcare, construction, many of these in industries depend upon a supply of entry level and younger workers who will then be up upwardly mobile just as our ancestors were. Um, we also need seasonal workers that benefits both of our countries. Um, I have it personally experienced, and I put in my longer testimony, um, many, um, many episodes of high-speed chases by Border Patrol um, through, in one case, my front driveway, um, which I have detailed. You know, sharing some of these stories does not at all undermine the efforts of the Border Patrol. We are grateful for their service. And our ranch liaison, uh, Jake Stukenberg, is doing a wonderful job. And I've called him at 11 o'clock at night when we've had an incident on our ranch, and he's right there, and we really appreciate that. Um, however, following the recommendations that were part of the 9-11 report, we understand some of these have still not been implemented about communications, um, the ports of entry, um, and cracking down on employers, may I say, that hire people illegally. We were one of the first employers in Arizona to voluntarily use the E-Verify program, and we continue to do that with good results to this day. We don't appreciate other employers hiring people illegally because they undercut our wages and our benefits. We've had health benefits for our workers since the 50s, and um, you know they're, un they're competing unfairly. And we also drug test all of our employees, including our management, and including Dick and myself on a random basis to cut down on the demand, which is what the sheriff was talking about in Cochise County. It has to be a multi-layered strategy. It can't just be one thing. The SCAP funding is also very important. So um, again, I would be happy to uh, go into this more with some specific recommendations that we have made. Um, I also serve on the uh, National Immigration Forum Board, which is a nonpartisan uh, group of people interested in a humane and enforceable uh, immigration reform. And um, we, we really appreciate your efforts to work together on a bipartisan basis. This, this is too important for any of us to play politics with. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wellman. Chair, now recognizing Mr. Kuntz. Chairwoman Ms. <coughs> McSally and Mr. Pierce, thank you for coming down here today. My name is Frank Krentz. I'm fifth generation rancher in Cochise County on the same piece of ground that my forefather started 109 years ago. Um, Almost six years ago, one morning, my cousin, my uncle, my father, and myself sat down for breakfast and talked about what we were going to do for the day. When we finished, my cousin and I went to move cows while my father went to check motor and my other uncle went to look at waters on the ranch. That was the last time I saw my father. Rob Krentz was on his way to check motor when he called his brother on the cell phone and said there was someone walking across the pasture and was going to go see what was going on. Friends and neighbors came to help us look for my father when we couldn't get a hold of him for hours. 
A neighbor called the sheriff's search and rescue team and they started looking as well. The news came in late that night that they had found my father. Rob was a great and caring man, helpful to others and dedicated to a way of life that he loved. He worked to help others, volunteering his time and helped the local school and his community, family and friends. To understand where I'm coming from, you need to know the people that, are li that live in this area. Most of the people in this part of the world has had at least one incident that has involved problems with people trespassing across from the southern border illegally. When I was younger, we would see people crossing the border and knew that they were, they were running from problems worse than getting caught on the northern side. Knowing that the Arizona desert can be dangerous to cross, we would make sure that they would be Border Patrol on the way to help them. I can remember a time in 1999, I saw two different groups of people crossing the ranch that numbered larger than 100. We used to approach these people as Christians to make sure that there were no injury and tell them that Border Patrol would be here shortly to help them. We would always do this even, though, even after we have had our houses broken into, our vehicles stolen, trash left, a country, left in the country, and water lines broke. There have been many times when we would go and check storage tanks that we would spend a week's worth of time to make full, be drained because illegals would break water lines or floats to get a drink of water and draining thousands of gallons of water out on the ground. And we would still try our best to give these people help. After losing my father, all of that changed. Now we don't go near these people, knowing, not knowing what the situation holds. We don't put ourselves in a position that would get us into trouble. The people we see now are not the large groups fleeing but the small groups packing drugs. There have been pictures taken of these small groups armed as well. I was told once by a U.S. congressman that the people along the border have become numb to the whole border issue, that they we have gotten used to the idea that this is the new norm if they want to live here. I wouldn't say that we have become numb, but we have become resilient, that we want to live in this part of the world that many of the families around have been here for many years and generations and hope to have many more generations on this part of the country that they have carved out for themselves. People who aren't from here get shocked when I tell them the problems we face on a daily basis. They ask, why don't you move away from there? It is hard for some people to know what 100 years of working in one place can look like. I am fifth generation rancher and feel a sense of pride of what I'm doing raising livestock for our nation. Being out in the country and working in a business sector that is less than 2% two, two of the country is able to do. As our guests leave here today, I would like to take you with the, thank I would like you to take with you the gratitude from me and my friends and family for hearing what we have gone through. To go back and say that there is a problem that needs more attention. Before I close and I have a little bit of money, I would like to be noted in the record some other issues that need to be held up. Ever since I was a little kid, one of my, our family friends, Gary Thrasher, is the local vet in the area and I'm sure you all have met him before. He has always voiced to me that one of the major issues that sees in rural agriculture is a um, disease that can be easily transported across the border. My great uncle in the 40s and 50s fought back tuberculosis and hoof and mouth out of the United States and fought it into Sonora, Mexico, into the, Chir into the Chihuahua, Mexico, and fought it deep down south. And, and the Mexican government has been doing a good work of trying to regulate that disease in uh, the health of the animals, keep it away from our borders. Because once that does get into our nation's food supply, it can be very detrimental. It can eradicate whole herds and whole counties. It can be that fast spreading. Um, another issue that I would like you to be aware of is like Mr. Ortega saying about how the population has decreased over the last number of years. It has also affected the land values. I have had a neighboring rancher that has recently had to have his ranch appraised for um, business organization. And he says in the last 15 years, his ranch has lost half of its value just because of the location to the border. Um, when you go back, I would like you to heed that there are issues that are addressed and that securing the border is not just not allowing anybody in, but it's controlling what can come in and making it in a manageable factor because 
as a simple ranching analogy, if you run too many cows, you're going to run out of grass, and then you're not going to be able to run any. So I would like you to go back, um, and thank you for listening for us today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kranz, and I say from myself, Mr. Pierce, I mean, our, our hearts will continue to be with your family. You, you know personally um, the price that you paid every day with the loss of your dad um, from an unsecured border, and I really appreciate you coming and sharing your perspectives today. Um, I want to thank the, the diversity and the perspectives of the whole panel. I want to start with a similar question I asked the first panel, uh, which, which is, well, part of it is, what trends have you seen, and we've heard some of this from you, the trends that we've seen over the last decades uh, shifting really from poten you know, potentially more people coming to find work versus hardened cartels that are now controlling traffic that have become far more dangerous. But you know, what do you want Washington, D.C. and others, what do you want in the record, besides what you just said, the trends that have, that have changed over the years, uh, what do you need them to hear from you and your perspectives of what's going on in our communities? And if the president were standing before you today and you're the new Secretary of Homeland Security and you are in charge of now securing the border, it's your strategy, it's your ideas, your resource unconstrained, from each of your perspectives, what would that look like? What would you do in order to address these issues that you've all very eloquently brought to our attention today? Starting with Mr. Bennett. Well, I think I would, I would start with what my main point was, was actually getting access to the border. And, and the previous panel, we talked about the wilderness areas and, and things of that nature uh, that prevent access uh, uh, and, and prevent uh, sometimes the ability to, to patrol the border. Uh, if there's an actual pursuit going on, there's, there's MOUs in place. But a lot of our ranch is on federal land. And there's a big process that needs to be go gone through to, to get roads put in. We just had a two-mile stretch of road put in along the border, as close to the border as you could get it, because the terrain is very, very difficult. And so they, they were able to, to, to get it as close to the border as, as possible. Uh, but that process took more than a decade to get done. And, and most of it because of the required permitting and everything else to, to, to get it okayed to get done. It took about four years to construct, and they're just finishing it up right now, and it's two miles. So, but it's made a difference. The technology has made a difference. Um, but it's only in a limited space, like I told you. We need to keep that progress and keep it going. And so, for me, it's, it's, it's getting the access, getting to a place where we can defend, and uh, and then having the resources to back it up because there is no silver bullet. It's not just that one thing. We need everything. We need boots on the ground. We need consequences. We need uh, air support. We need everything to, to get it done because there's not one key you can stick in that's going to stop it. You need to have a, a, a myriad of things to, to, to do that. Great, thanks. Vice Chairman. Thank you. Um, one of the huge trends that has changed is the t types of folks that we encounter in the Migrant Resource Center. Uh, our ministry began 10 years ago um, having what's called the Migrant Resource Center on the south side of the border, uh, and we've received over 80, 86,000 men, women, and children who have been returned uh, to Mexico uh, from the United States by uh, our, our U.S. Border Patrol. Um, early on the time, there was lots of folks who were crossing for the first time, uh, going for job purposes, uh, things like that. One of the things we've seen uh, dramatically in the last piece is the number of people who are returning to the United States, uh, not going for the first time, uh, usually going to be reunited with families um, in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, you know, having uh, lived, there's one woman I mentioned in my written testimony, Guillermina, uh, who has lived in South Carolina for over 10 years, and she ended up in the center um, has a six-year-old son uh, who was born in South Carolina, and uh, she returned uh, to, to Mexico to see her dying father, and she talked about being caught between two worlds, and, uh, and she said, just pray for us, uh, pray. Um, and so that's a reality that we're seeing is more folks who, especially from Mexico, um, you know, as there's not as much economic migration, but the folks who are uh, returning from Mexico tend to be folks returning so that's a, a big trend. Uh, the other uh, trend uh, that we saw at our, our prayer vigil on every Tuesday, we have a prayer vigil for uh, those who've died crossing into the United States. 
Um, and one of the things that we began seeing uh, in the early uh, 2000s is more and more women showing up on uh, the crosses um, that uh, were there. And so I think uh, early, and <coughs> this is going back a little bit historically, but um, there was a, a shift from mainly uh, young men crossing uh, the border to women crossing the border. And one of our partners in Colorado, um, we were up visiting there, and they took us to a place where uh, they used to have a migrant housing, and it had been a big a kind of bunkhouse, and it had been changed into um, townhouses. And so we asked them, what, what's changed? And they said, well, now, uh, now families are coming, uh, women are coming. And so one of the ir ironies of our border security policy of the, of the 90s is in many ways we did a better job of keeping people in the country as opposed to out of the country because it changed to sort patterns of mi migrating for five years or so and going back every year as it became harder and more expensive and more dangerous uh, to return home uh, between seasons, people stayed. And once that happened, we and I've personally had families struggle with this, uh, what do you do with uh, separated families? And so more women have gone. And, and unfortunately, there's a higher number percentage of women dying uh, as opposed to their numbers th than men. And that's something that we've seen as well uh, there. A trend that we uh, haven't uh, seen change is the, the percentage of death happening crossing. Even as the number of people crossing has gone down, uh, the percentage per crossing of people dying has actually maintained the same or increased a little bit. So that's a disturbing trend that has not changed and needs to change. And then the second piece that hasn't changed, that needs to change, is this dichotomy between security and immigration reform. Uh, I think that's a very false dichotomy, uh, and, it, and it's a very dangerous dichotomy, uh, because we've been hearing it for 20 years. Um, and it, it seems like a simple thing to me, and maybe it's not, um, but it seems like if we take folks who are coming for economic reasons or for family reasons, uh, like many of our ancestors had come in the past, and look at the economic realities on both sides of our borders, and we provide for uh, safe and efficient ways for folks to come through ports of entry, then it'd be a lot easier for our law enforcement to be able to detect folks who are coming with ill intent. And so I think we need to change that trend, and you can be one of the persons to change that trend, uh, to say that's a false dichotomy and it needs to change, because if it doesn't change, we're not gonna have a secure border, uh, and we're gonna increase in to continue to increase the number of people who have died trying to reach the American dream. Thanks. Chairwoman McSally, I, if I had an unlimited amount of resources, there's a ton of things I would do, and if I had the president in front of me, I'd say a whole lot of things. Um, one of the things that's uh, most important to us and, and what I testified to was toward the, the efficient uh, and expedient uh, flow of commerce between the ports of entry. And that's extremely important for us uh, in Nogales, Arizona. One of the things that's bothersome is that within the Department of Homeland Security structure, you have Border Patrol, which is funded by a direct appropriations, and you have Customs that is partially uh, funded by user fees and, dire uh, and direct uh, appropriation. I, I think that that is a, uh, an issue that needs to be addressed. Uh, it shouldn't be an either or issue. I think commerce is just as important as what happens in the rural areas of the United States. Um, I have a tremendous amount of respect for the ranchers and for the rural areas of Arizona. I have a great relationship with Dan Bell. We happen to be neighbors uh, and growing up as kids. Uh, I, and I understand their issues and even uh, the agent Del Cuarto said that the agencies did not grow in the same way uh, in the last 10 years, 10 to 15 years. Uh, I think that we, as we strengthened uh, between our ports of entry on our rural areas where we grew Border Patrol, I think we had a tough time in growing customs and therefore many more uh, ports of entry became porous. Um, as you can see from the terrorists from 9-11, they all came through a, a port of entry, whether it was a seaport, a land port, or an airport. They didn't come through the 
through the desert. That doesn't mean that it can't happen in the future. But our ports of entry, I believe, are just as important and they are just as dangerous. You have the port of Nogales that catches as much drugs as any five ports on the, on the southern port of Texas. So that is extremely dangerous and it is only escalating. It's also dangerous to have an understaffed port of entry. Uh, you have agents on the border that are working 16 hour shifts and they have very, very little time to determine what is in front of them. When they have a car that comes in front of them or a pedestrian that crosses right in front of them, they have very little time to uh, examine them and figure out exactly if they are coming for uh, legitimate trade and legitimate purposes or for illegal purposes. So I, I think that that's one of the things that I would ask you all to change. When I ask you to change the paradigm, that's one of them. Um, I, it, Mr. Del Cuarto also says that uh, the way and the metrics of which um, the statistics are given um, are probably not true. I tend to believe him. I think that we should be able to have a much better metrics, but that also applies to our ports of entry. It is not only at our rural areas where we have figures and statistics that are not correct, but it also is at our ports of entry. When we say when our in Washington that our ports of entry are secure, that is not correct. If we are getting the amount of drugs an illegal contraband, whether it's uh, counterfeit money or counterfeit Levi's or counterfeit shoes or whatever it may be, or even southbound with uh, illegal proceeds or weapons and bullets that are found in our southbound inspections, then we have just as much of a danger there than we do in the rural areas. But let me be clear, this is not an either or thing. I believe the federal government can do both things at the same time. Securing Danny Bell's ranch and securing Jaime Chamberlain's port of entry are extremely important, but they are not just our situations. They are all our country situations and they are definitely an issue for the state of Arizona we tend to be looked over when this strategy comes into place. I really, really thank you all for allowing us to testify in front of you, to have a voice in Washington, D.C., so that you can convey what we feel every single day. This is something that has been lacking for the state of Arizona for many, many years. Finally, we have a seat at the table. Hopefully, we're going to be heard. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chamberlain. Uh, before we go on to Ms. Walton, I just want to uh, reiterate uh, the importance of many of the issues that, that, that you raised uh, at our ports of entry. Uh, we, again, we were focusing on the, the rural areas and between the ports, but we, can't, we have to chew gum and walk at the same time. We have to be able to do both of these. These are vitally important for those that are in the audience uh, didn't tune into our last hearing. This is something that is impacting us from a security and an economic point of view uh, in Arizona and across the country. Uh, I'm proud to say my first bill passed into law is the Border Jobs for Veterans Act, which is, which is intended to address some of these uh, shortage issues. It takes 18 months for someone to be hired for one of these critical positions at our ports of entry, 18 months. You said we should be moving at the speed of business, uh, it's moving at the speed of bureaucracy and nobody can wait for 18 months to get a job. And while we need to vet them, this is just unsatisfactory and we're gonna continue to hammer and do what we can in order to speed up this timeline uh, for those that are veterans and others that are looking for these jobs that are <coughs> critical. This next week in Congress, we're gonna be voting on a number of bills related to the opioid uh, tragedy that's happening across our country. We have, we have a, uh, an epidemic of those that are addicted and dying from opioid abuse. This is like we have not seen 
in my lifetime, these last few years. And the price of drugs, the price of opioids is still cheap. So we have a long way to go to be able to address this issue. And it's literally causing uh, deaths of sons and daughters in our community. And we've got to address this in a very uh, holistic approach as well. So I just want to comment on that and uh, hand it to Mr. Walton. Thank you. As you can see, there's more that we agree on than we disagree on. And sometimes we find it very hard to understand why our representatives in Washington can't sit down and reason together on such vital issues. I'd like to echo uh, really what everyone has said so far. Um, you know, we're confusing Juan or Juanita, as the pastor pointed out, who just wants to come here and work, maybe seasonally or maybe earn a legal path to citizenship, with Juan, the drug smuggler. And, and that's the big problem. And Border Patrol, speaking off the record, when we talk to them on our ranches and farms, they will say, you know, right now I'm looking for a needle in a haystack. My haystack is too big. I, I've got all these people lumped into the same category. And if there it could be a way to differentiate so I can really focus on the terrorists and the drug smugglers and the human smugglers and the people that mean our country harm and frankly harm to Mexico as well, that would make my job so much easier which is why, again, I, I agree so much with what Jaime Chamberlain just said about the need to do immigration reform hand in hand. If we had um, an ID card with a biometric marker, if we had a reasonable path to citizenship or at least a temporary worker permit so they could work here while they're trying to be become citizens if they are eligible, it would cut out the underground economy, it they would pay taxes, they would, we would pay into Social Security, uh, we would uh, eliminate the employers that are abusing them. We would eliminate people being afraid to report criminal activity or domestic violence. Um, there's so many. We, we would eliminate all these hardships on these families who might have, you know, some members are legal, the children might be legal, but maybe the grandfather or one of the parents is not legal. It, it is just tearing this country apart. And let's remember for a minute, you know, this was Mexico where we are sitting up until recent times. And we still have families that live and work on both sides of the line, that own ranches and farms on both sides of the line. Uh, we source pecans from Mexico. I mean, our, our countries and our cultures are so integrated here. And this is true of the Native American people too, by the way, who live on both sides of, of what's currently the border. So uh, we also, I think, need to, to realize that the Border Patrol and this new organization under Homeland Security is relatively new. It doesn't have the checks and balances of our military. Frankly, I don't believe it has the strategic capabilities of our military in many ways. Um, you know, the training, um, the lack of metrics, I think both GAO, the University of Arizona Udall Center, and some other studies that have been done show that um, the, the Border Patrol isn't keeping statistics, you know, correctly and accurately the way that we do, we do in the armed forces, for example. And I think this is very important. So I think anything that can be done organizationally, anything that can be done to increase um, the training of a lot of these young agents, um, frankly, it's not just more boots on the ground, but it's the training and the coordination and their work with local law enforcement. That's really what is going to make them successful um, in their, in their uh, missions in the field. Uh, and then, you know, from all standpoints, one of the, the groups that I serve on the board of the National Immigration Forum has formed the Bibles, Badges, and Business Coalition. And these are people from uh, the faith community, from law enforcement, and from the business community. We all agree on, on the problems here, and at least on some of the solutions. So um, again, we are grateful for you being here today and gathering the information firsthand, and, and certainly you know, also your efforts on the drug treatment. We have to have on-demand treatment. We have to recognize that this drug pandemic mm -hmm. is like a war. It's wiping out a generation of Americans. It's leaving others impaired forever. They're going to be a huge burden to our society, and it's a huge loss of the best and the brightest that are going to be our future leaders. So uh, we commend you on your work on that as well. Thank you, Mr. Walden. Mr. Grant? Being the last one on the panel, I could say I concur and I'd be fine. But, um, <laughs> we'll start with you on the next <laughs> <laughs> Right. The next um, you build a 12-foot wall, somebody's going to build a 13-foot ladder. You build a 50-foot wide wall, somebody's going to dig a half-mile tunnel. I don't think a wall is the end-all answer. You know, half the border isn't secured with a wall because of terrain. It's just that difficult to put in. Um, there are current laws and regulations on the books that are very valid and very feasible. You know, the people that are on the ground, the Border Patrol, 
the sheriff's departments. Um, the sheriff's department is a lot more agile on accessing their laws so that they can prosecute uh, perpetrators than the Border Patrol has. Um, if there was a better way for the Border Patrol to be able to do what they're able to do and capable of but not able to do, that would solve a lot of the situations. Um, an easier way for people to get a uh, direct visa. Uh, if somebody that wants to come in this country, my grandfather, uh, prior to the Vicero program, worked people and helped them into citizenship. And if you want to find somebody that is more aggravated of illegal immigration, go talk to those gentlemen that are now productive members of society in America and are proud to be here that work through the proper system. They are very aggravated of people that are taking advantage of the system. If there was an easier way for them, for the people that want to be in here, to be in here, that would make our illegal crossing in the deaths across the arid Arizona and New Mexico regions a lot less of an issue. Um, one of the other things is the circuit courts. Why do we hear of people that are crossing the border ask when they get caught by Border Patrol, well, where am I at? Am I in Arizona in the Ninth Circuit or am I in New Mexico on the Eighth Circuit? And that's all on the whole leniency of the court system, which the further west you go, the more lenient you are on uh, issues like that. I know those are kind of taboo type subjects, but those are what's, that's what's happening out here. If you can address some of those issues, you could probably get ahead. If you had unre unlimited funds to solve the situation, um, a simple rancher analogy, make that side of the fence better than your side so that if people want to stay home. You know, you have to get rid of the more the system, you have to get rid of the, the hierarchy that is entrenched into uh, the society. Um, but that is something that's a long, that's been that way for many, 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 many years. So. But I believe if you could start with letting the Border Patrol do what they're capable of, and then um, the way the judicial system is set up, you would have a pretty good start. There's no reason to start new laws when some of the ones that are here have already worked. Thank Great, you. thank you, Mr. Krentz. Uh, before I hand it over to, to Mr. Pierce, uh, I, I, I'm always trying to look for where we can find agreement, and so I just want to rephrase what I think I heard, although there's some different perspectives uh, from the whole panel. This is not intended to be about immigration reform as its main uh, focus, but I think everyone on the panel, uh, there may be great disagreement on what to do with those that are here illegally, and we could debate that you know, for the rest of the day or week. Uh, but I think everybody here agrees that we need a legal immigration system that actually allows for people to come over and spend money for the day, come shop at our malls, and come through the ports of entry in a way that they are vetted and able to either shop or work temporarily in positions that are going to grow our economy. We can't accept everybody. Uh, we, 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 we can't, but there's got to be a better system right now. It's cumbersome. It takes too long. It's confusing. It's based on random country quotas uh, that allow people to come through the turnstile that are going to actually help our economy, not hurt our economy. And so there needs to be a revamping and a modernizing of the legal immigration system. Is that a fair statement that people, uh, on, everyone on the panel agrees to? Just want to hear yes, is that everybody? Mr. Bell? Yes. Mr. Durant, Pastor Adams? Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. Um, yes. Yes. Okay, great. We found another area that generally, again, how that happens, there's a lot of devils in the details, <coughs> um, but uh, you know, addressing that particular issue so that we can focus on the transnational criminal organizations. Uh, and uh, again, still, there's, there's some challenges moving forward with all of this, but I just want to find those areas of agreement, and I'll hand it over to Mr. Pierce. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, just on following up on the, the, that agreement, uh, there's actually down in the trenches in the back uh, back rows much more agreement between the parties. The differences come as it moves towards leadership, and they, the leadership on both parties has agreements and hooks on them or whatever. And so that's that's uh, just the truth of the matter. Beto O'Rourke's out of El Paso, and he and I've uh, worked on a couple of bills, and we decided that if. We, we felt like we should show that Democrats and Republicans are working together. And, and then we said we ought to go at the hardest issue, and that's immigration. And uh, so we've got a couple of bills that are just uh, very limited. But I think if we would start taking limited solutions to pieces of the problem, we could start unraveling it 
but many, many in Washington just refuse uh, any single uh, attempts and efforts, and so it's, uh, it's one reason the system bogs down. Uh, Mr. Chamber, I appreciate your passion about business. Again, as a business person, I, uh, that's an, something I identify with. But I will tell you from my perspective on this side of the table that when we increase the assets, we don't usually see much change, and it gets very frustrating. So we increased the Border Patrol by double back under President Bush. But in the last 10 years, from 2005 to 2015, Customs has gone up double from about $5 billion to $10 billion. And I'm hearing you that it hasn't changed any. And so when, uh, did you wanna say something? That, yeah, so, so uh, and then to the whole idea of technology. I mean, right now we've got towers and, and, and cameras going up. Mr. Bell, you mentioned those. But a decade ago, we put 200 million into a system that was supposed to be computers, towers, and, and cameras. And we did not, for the whole border, did not get one functioning system. Some had towers and no computers. Some had cameras and no towers. Some had computers and no towers or cameras. And you get very frustrated with an agency that will squander $200 million, that will squander everything you put. And so uh, I just, it, it is a very frustrating thing to hear that the, the money we're channeling into customs, not Border Patrol, that's different. So the money we're channeling to customs, it never feeds down to here. Now, I'd, we, we uh, lobbied and, and uh, got a new border crossing at, at one of the towns in our district. And then again, they started saying the day after they built it, well, it should have had a truck lane and it doesn't. And you just sit here and you just say, you know, you built a thing from new and you designed it, not Congress. Go ahead, sir. You're correct, and I'm very frustrated. Um, we worked very diligently in Nogales, Arizona, and there were many stakeholders that worked diligently on the building and the remodeling of the Mariposa Port of Entry. It was a tremendous feat. We were extremely fortunate that there was stimulus money and that our project was shovel ready at the time that uh, funding became available. Um, even with that said, um, Customs changed their processes and asked that once we were almost done with the remodeling that they were going to start checking all of the southbound trucks. And uh, they would have random checks of southbound uh, cars also. So with no more federal funding uh, available, Customs was uh, very, very uh, creative in coming up with and changing their budget to include two southbound lanes, which were absolutely um, necessary. Uh, they, those southbound lanes and that southbound inspection has, r I don't know how many weapons and um, uh, ammunition caches they've gotten. I don't know how many how much money they've uh, they've uh, um, gotten, but it's been in the millions of dollars worth, and it has been extremely essential. But with that said, we still don't have a port of entry. We have a brand new port of entry, but it's understaffed by 300 agents. Yeah. To be understaffed by 300 agents is absolutely not acceptable for the state of Arizona or for their country. Yeah. So. And, and their canine units, which to me would be a, even a little bit easier. Um, we're 20 canine units um, below what we should be. So the funding may be, um, <coughs> may be getting to somewhere, but it's not com getting to the border. Yeah. And it's not getting to the line. The, we are losing more agents to attrition than we are in how as fast as we're hiring. We're not hiring fast enough. Now, Congresswoman McSally has made changes in a bill that she's made so that that hiring process is a little bit more streamlined. Um, that's a start. That is definitely a start. But the recognition, I think, is even more important that our ports are not adequate whether they're in Long Beach in a seaport or a Houston airport 
or an Ogalis port of entry, they are not efficient one bit whatsoever. If we were to have more efficient ports of entry, our economy would be booming. But that's part of it. I, I, I think that's uh, probably my point when I said earlier that, that the systems are broken completely in Washington because we are dedicating the resources, but they don't have enough internal discipline or process to see that the resources get where they need. And so it just it gets very frustrating, and I appreciate your input. Uh, Ms. Yep. Walden, you said that you all use the E-Verify now as, a, as an employer in the oil field. My wife and I had a small business. We were frightened every day uh, that uh, that we didn't have the paperwork right, right and they'd come in and start right, charging right, us right. 10000 bucks a day. Right. Is the E-Verify actually working now? You know, it's been very good. We were a little bit worried because we started very, very early um, around the time of um, SB 1070, the state law on mm -hmm. this, which we had problems with major provisions of. but. We were a little worried that with the tremendous demand as uh, more and more employers used it, that it might break down. But actually, it takes a couple hours of training uh, for your personnel or HR person, and we have a couple trained in it. And um, the, the one problem we've had occasionally is, you know, in the um, uh, uh, Hispanic culture, there are often multiple names, and the maiden name as well as the surname of the, the father. So sometimes, uh, with multiple names, and depending on how many they use, that might kick back somebody who's legal. But you know, we usually just put it back through again, and it works out, or it doesn't. But it, but, but it really has helped tremendously, and um, we think that that employers should be required to use that. And I think to you know to um, Mr. Kren's point earlier, the problem is when our grandparents came across, it didn't take ten years to go through the process to be made legal. There is a problem, and you weren't penalized for working during that time and, and forced into an underground economy while you were trying to get your paperwork for either temporary or permanent citizenship. So again, it goes to the efficiencies. You're absolutely right, but it, it definitely has an impact on business. The, and again, I will re-look at that because I've been one of the ones who's reluctant to have uh, consequences for employers because if your government can't tell you who is legal and who is not illegal, how can you then push the responsibility down to employers, uh, but if the E-Verify is starting to tighten up the process, then, then I will relook at that. Uh, Mr. Adams, the, I appreciate your heart for the human situation. Uh, I was left with a question as you testified, are you, would you contend for an open border? You're saying that you compared it to North Carolina, South Carolina, and then, then the huddled masses wanted to come here. Uh, so just trying to clarify for myself that 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 would be your position that you would favor just plain open border is that mm. um, I'm here as a representative of the Presbyterian Church USA as mm -hmm. well as a individual. Now just as you as an individual. I'm not asking their mm, position. Well, no, I'm I can't separate that right now mm -hmm. um, And the the policy of the of the Presbyterian Church uh, is in the written testimony mm -hmm. uh, that would state that uh, that nations have the right to to you know, determine who enters and, and, and doesn't. My, my contention would agree with that and to make that a safe and efficient way that folks can come through, through ports of entry um, and not go through, de through deserts. Um, I would ask Mr. Bell, but I think I know the answer is, uh, is the barbed wire fence more effective than the 12-foot uh, high fence? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> just, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, uh, and, and just to answer a previous question that you had for the other panel, um, yes, we do have those smuggler signs, that smuggler and illegal activity in the area. So we have that on our ranch, actually, as, we, as people go in and recreate, they get to see those. But um, I, it'll, it'll, it'll be interesting to find out because we did just get a, we've got the two mile border wall that had a road con constructed alongside of it. They just completed that extension road uh, two miles along the barbed wire section with which there's no funding to do a, a, a border wall. So it'll be interesting to see what happens, but there, the technology's been placed in the area. And I'll tell you, when even before the, the things were turned on, we were seeing differences in patterns uh, of, of folks coming through. Uh, granted, it was getting pushed over to the western portion of the ranch and to, uh, on to some of our neighbors, but it was coming, people could see it, they could see the road systems coming, and, and, the, and, and they're, they're looking to stay away. Um, that's not to say they're not coming through, but they're being detected. And so we've had a couple of drug seizures uh, in, in vehicles uh, due to the, the, the cameras picking, picking things up, uh, some uh, 
people that are that are crossing illegally are getting picked up along the way. So it, it's it's definitely made a difference. Um, okay. And so we, it, time is going to tell. But uh, it's it's my contention that if you can get down there and patrol the border, regardless of whether it's the 18 foot fence, bollard style fence, or the or the barbed wire fence. Being able to patrol the border is going to make the difference. That's what's going to make the difference. Okay, Madam Chair, I've just got a couple of quick questions, and they don't need very long answers. But um, the Mr. Chamberlain, so the X-ray units that that are there, are they? Do you have them here in Nogales, and are they working? They're supposed to X-ray the entire truck and just see if in a second if they need to pull it out of the line and then tear it apart. Are those working, or do you, do you have them here? We do have them here at the new port of entry. We do. Uh, they do about seven trucks, I believe, in about a 90 seconds, something like that. Mm -hmm. So they are, they are much more efficient. We process uh, during our peak season anywhere between 1,600 and 1,800 trucks a day. We could have, we have the capability at the brand new port of entry to, ha to process over 4,000 trucks a day. Uh, hopefully, as a businessman, that's my goal, to get to that, to get to max capacity for our port of entry. But if we don't have the staffing for it, there's no use. Yeah. You can have all the technology you want, and at the end of the day, you still need the staffing for it. You, you, there's a human uh, instinct about contraband, and uh, you still need that. Machines can't do everything. I will be a voice asking where the other the doubling of funding went, and how come it didn't go to the Nogales port. So. <laughs> anyway, you got that out of the way at least. Thank uh, you. Mr. I appreciate <laughs> Mr. that. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Krantz. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, okay, so Mr. Krentz, we, um, your father helped people who were coming across, give them water, give them food. Uh, is that more or less correct? Yes. And still, and they knew that, the people on the other side of the border, they know who's over here. Yeah, we also, uh, you know, growing up, even when my dad was growing up, we had dealings with the ranchers on the other side, traded cattle across, bought Mexican cattle at the border there in Arnold Prieta. Uh, you know, we've been in the area a long time. Um, but just like you said earlier, is that with the cartels coming in, the whole mentality of who is there and what their morals are has changed as well. You know? That's right. And so was that, uh, did you all have a feeling that was retaliatory for turning in groups or whatever? Oh, I would I would hope not, but I don't know. I think it was more You don't think people on the other side uh, said, okay, if you ever that cooperate with the law enforcement, we'll come get you. You don't think they No, would? I think the guy that was probably involved was probably just not a good just person. Just a single yeah. isolated incident. Yeah, but okay. he, the reason that he was there was not because he was trying to find a hotel cleaning job. Right, okay. So. Madam Chair, thank you very much. I uh, would yield back. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Pierce. Um, I want to highlight, you mentioned the waste, a lot of waste of money. There has been a significant waste of resources put into a lot of good ideas. And um, uh, one of my seven bills that passed the House is called the Border Technology Accountability Act. Uh, it is, as we speak, a waiting movement in the Senate. Uh, we could get this thing on the President's desk, which is basically intended to provide oversight and accountability to procurement programs for border technology. I mean, this is common sense stuff to make sure we're good stewards of the taxpayer money. And it was unanimously passed in the House. We expected it to, to slide through. We thought it'd be law by now, but somebody, there's, a, there's a, evidently a Democrat holding it up in the Senate, not letting it go through. Uh, the intel that we were getting is a statement along the lines of they don't want to see Republicans get a win on anything related to border. This is part of the dysfunction in Washington, D.C. This is something everybody could agree upon. Let's be good stewards of taxpayers' resources. So I'd encourage whoever is holding up that bill that they need to get it to the president's desk uh, because this is an important thing for us to be able to do. Uh, I, I just have one final, and I don't, I don't want to. I know I want to be um, uh, respectful of everybody's time, but I do want to give this panel an opportunity to comment on uh, the interior checkpoints and the defense in depth strategy uh, from your perspectives uh, and, and what the implications of that and, and uh, what your opinion are of, of that strategy. And I'll start with Mr. Krentz. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I live on one of the only highways north of the border that doesn't have a checkpoint. Uh, and they, I have been told or heard that that is so that they can go through, get out of the populated areas and get on their way and then they'll catch them somewhere on the interior side. 
on the fixed checkpoints, I've also heard agents say that they know that they'll unload before the checkpoints, walk around the checkpoints, and then get picked up afterwards. Um, you know, like the, I think Del Cueto said, or Del Cueto said earlier, um, the Darwinian people, they're the ones that are the only one to get caught there at the checkpoint. Hey, that was my statement. Yeah, <laughs> well, <didn't> you? <laughs> <That was> <laughs> About him. <laughs> um, so I've seen them as a, you know, it's just kind of like the wall. Is it the stopping point? No, but it is a deterrent to kind of slow them down to maybe catch them somewhere else, but that's about all. Ms. Morgan? Uh, we recommended in our citizens report roving checkpoints. We think that those are a lot more effective. Um, by surprise, change them up, you know, switch them up. And um, again, you know, um, Dick has shared with me the, um, the excellent infrared uh, capabilities they had from airplanes when he flew the OV-1 Mohawk in Vietnam. I'm sure it's, you know, light years ahead of that today. So we should be using things like that and, and not spending $20 million on an SBI net that, that could have been shot out, by the way, all those towers by a BB gun, let alone a shotgun. It was the most ridiculous idea. So we're all for accountability and, and congratulations to you on, on furthering that in the bill. Finally, I just want to say, having come from the recent hearing on federal lands, my understanding is, is that um, Border Patrol and other uh, federal agencies, other federal law enforcement, um, as well as local law enforcement, have full access to federal lands. Uh, whether they're in hot pursuit or not, if they have any suspicion of criminal activity. And, you know, a lot of our friends who are ranchers in the Malpai group, like, like uh, Warner and Wendy Glenn, um, late Wendy Glenn, we're concerned about more roads and wilderness areas, not just for the aesthetics, but because they would be used by the traffickers. So I think, you know, I'm going to leave that to the people that have ranches along the border. I think there are areas where it is appropriate. But like Dan said, the terrain is so complex. I mean, this is not an easy fix. So just be aware of that, that you have to get a lot of local input as to whether you're making the problem better or worse. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. The depth strategy uh, for us in the produce industry is a little bit cumbersome. Uh, the the two-back checkpoint there, as you come south to north, you can see where the trucks have really, really done a tremendous job on the, on the, on the highway there. You have the ruts in the road that are absolutely terrible. Someone's got to be able to pay for that. I don't know if that's going to be a federal issue or that's going to be a state issue, but uh, regardless, someone th should have thought of that before they did the, the, the checkpoint at that point. The also, the land values, and I completely understand, and the businessmen mm -hmm. that have suffered in their, in with the reduction of their business values and their land and their home values. That's difficult for us. But not only, you have to understand that for us, this is a tremendous freight corridor, an extremely important freight corridor for our country to move goods and services, whether it's the maquiladora business or the cattle business or the mining business or the produce industry. We are moving a tremendous amount of commerce through this highway here, from Nogales to, to where we get to our major arteries in the Tucson and the Phoenix areas. So I think it is extremely important to patrol these areas just as much as we do in, in the rural parts of the, uh, of the state, but in an effective way. I don't see the checkpoints being that effective. Um, they are cumbersome. We have uh, businesses from all over the United States and chain stores and food service companies coming to pick up our product from all over the United States, and they don't get this at other states around the country. They don't have to go through these checkpoints at other states. In California you do, in Texas you do, in Arizona, and in New Mexico you do. I don't see that happening on the northern border. You have occasional checkpoints on the northern border, but they're nowhere as cumbersome to business and to tourism in the way that they are here. Thank so. You. Thank you. Pastor Adam? Um, the, the policy from our, our church says border protection policies, we, we advocate for border protection policies that are consistent with humanitarian values and with the need to treat all individuals with respect while allowing the authorities to carry out the critical <coughs> task of identifying and preventing entry of terrorists and dangerous criminals as well as pursuing the legitimate task of implementing American immigration policy. 
Um, the, for me, the, the checkpoints have been a very effective tool for me to realize that not everyone is treated with the same respect as I am going through uh, checkpoints. I think racial profiling. Um, it, growing up in South Carolina, it was easy for me to not think about that, believe it or not. Um, but now with a family who have folks who are um, both uh, complected, like have the same complexion I do, as, as well as folks who are darker complexion, um, when we go through that checkpoint uh, outside of Tombstone, we make sure I'm driving and not my wife, uh, Miriam. And um, we were going through that checkpoint one time with my sister-in-law uh, who was in the back and we just got waved right through. Uh, and my sister-in-law uh, said, hey, that's white privilege. <laughs> and so um, checkpoints, there are lots of problems that you've heard uh, about here, but one of the things about checkpoints is it, it highlights that we have a long way to go in this country regarding race and treating everyone with respect. Thanks, Pastor Adams. Mr. Bell? Well, I'd like to kind of start out with your defense in depth uh, issue there. And, and the problem is, is in, in areas like uh, my ranch and, and some of the stuff in the Malapai borderlands area, um, there is no access to the border. And that's something that I've been talking about quite a bit today. And so that's the only option that's out there unless you get people humping in or horse patrol going in or, or helicoptering people in. Those are basically the only options you have. So, so that's why it's important to be able to get that access and, and, and get down there. Um, the technology um, piece is, is, is important in that, whereas before we had seismic sensors set out. Well, they still do. But a sensor hit would come off. An agent would have no idea what that sensor hit was. Was it one of my cows? Was it a big mule deer? Uh, he's got to maybe hump in two, two hours of his day to go figure out what that sensor hit was. Yeah. Technology is going to help in, in, in some of these areas to identify what that sensor hit was. Focus in on that area where those sensor hits are happening. See what you can pick up. If it's a legitimate uh, uh, reason for an agent to go in, to maybe go in and, and, and apprehend a smuggler or, or, or a group, then they're gonna they're gonna know that's what it is instead of instead of uh, wasting time on something that isn't, and so th I think that's gonna free up resources. But again, that all comes with kind of deploying down closer to the area. So the, the defense and depth strategy, I'd like to see that go away. But in a lot of instances, that's the only thing that's available because some of the roads are backed off three, four, five, six, seven miles away from the border, and so uh, that's what our focus needs to be. As far as the checkpoint, um, you know, it's. It's one of those deals where, where it's, a, it's at what they call that choke point, and, uh, and so they can get the traffic coming off the, the interstate, but they've also got the mountain ranges on the flanks that's kind of choking things in, and so they've got a lot of technology between, you know, on either side of that checkpoint, and, and so they do make a lot of apprehensions and, and, and things in that area. So for now, uh, I think it's a, uh, it's a necessity, but let's, Let's, let's keep our focus on, on, on getting down to the border, to the line of scrimmage, as you say. <laughs> I agree with you. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, see where we are uh, with that checkpoint at, at, at a later date. Great. Thank you. Chris, do you have any more before we wrap up? Well, I just would like to, again, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank the audience. Uh, people always wonder where a republic democracy begins and begins right here, really. And I've heard several people today say that, th that we need to have the solutions coming from here towards Washington. I agree with that totally. Uh, so again, uh, Madam Chair, thanks for in the invitation today. And thanks to our panelists. Both panels have been just out, out uh, right stunning. So thank you very much. And uh, we'll carry these messages back to Washington. Absolutely. And I want to say thanks for joining us here. And uh, I appreciate uh, you taking your time and your interest in these issues as our adjoining uh, congressional district. I know there's other members of the committee that did want to be here. They do have your testimony. It is in the record. They may have some written questions for you. Uh, so we'll keep the record open for 10 days and ask for you uh, to respond uh, in writing, if, if you don't mind, for that. I, I do want to thank the audience and everybody's uh, patience and endurance to be able to listen to this, these important issues. I mean, this look, it took almost three hours here. But these are complex issues, uh, not going to be solved in a 15-second soundbite. And so I appreciate you all 
coming to listen. I really appreciate uh, both panels, uh, all of you on the second panel, for providing your uh, unique and important perspectives. I just want to say it's an honor to be in this position. We've never had anybody uh, chair this subcommittee before from Arizona. And uh, to be in this position that we can highlight what these issues are so we can find common ground and solutions uh, to these issues that are impacting our public safety, our economy, and really all aspects of the lives that, are, that have been reflected here uh, in our community here. And I like to s make decisions based on facts. It comes from basically you know, serving in the military. Let's figure out what we know, what we don't know, and then figure out how to fix the problems that we're facing. I think we can all agree uh, that our border is not as secure as it needs to be, uh, that this is a public safety issue, uh, that we need to make sure that as we're securing the border, we're doing it at the ports of entry and between the ports of entry, uh, and that we continue to have opportunities for commerce to grow uh, because our e economic uh, opportunities as a border community are just as important as security, and we need to use, do both of those at the same time. And so we've got uh, a lot of follow-ups to do from this, but I really appreciate these perspectives so we can make fact-based determinations as how to move forward in the role that Congress has, which is a very important oversight role uh, to the federal agencies responsible for keeping our country and community safe. And with that, let's make sure I've done all the admin here. Uh, I want to again thank the town of Saurita and uh, for allowing us to use this facility. And pursuant to Committee Rule 7C, the hearing record will be, or E, sorry, my contacts aren't working very well. 7E, the hearing record will be held open for 10 days. And without objection, the committee now stands adjourned.